Charles Beltran was born and raised in Austin, Texas. He has three sisters, and growing up in a rough neighborhood, he says he had a difficult childhood. Charles's father left the family when he was a small child, and his young mother was left to raise the children with only the help of her mother. Charles would say that he felt much closer to his grandmother than he did his mother, and he had a strong connection with all of his sisters. His mother was trying to figure life out. She worked many jobs but didn't keep them for long, and the family moved around quite a lot within what Charles calls the hood. Section 8 Living He and his sisters jumped from school to school, and even at times found themselves living in shelters. When Charles was 13, he met his father for the first time, but even then, the man didn't play much of a role in his life. He says that this affected him greatly, and he would think to himself, when I become a father, I'm going to do a much better job and be there for my children. At the beginning of his sophomore year, Charles drops out of school, and at 15 years old runs away from home to try make a life for himself. According to Charles, he says he does this because his mother was struggling to feed the family, and he felt, by running away, it would help her to focus on one less person so that his sisters could be provided with more. At 17 years old, he commits armed robbery and goes to prison for a short stint before being put on shock probation. When he gets out on probation, he violates the orders by smoking weed and having a dirty urine sample. He goes back to the penitentiary for two and a half years. Charles was an aspiring rapper and would go by the name Chuck5050, or at times, Chuck Gorgeous, and the group that he made music with were becoming quite popular in the Texas area, even scoring a spot playing at a music festival. On one of the periods when he was out of prison, a woman by the name of Megan reaches out to him. She had heard of him through his music and had also attended the same school, but they had never met before. She just started at the school when Charles had left. The two begin a relationship, and very quickly, Megan becomes pregnant. And uh, you're raising this baby together, and just be honest, Chuck, are you being really the, the dad that's there all the time, changing diapers, things of that nature early on? No. Okay, you're no, out partying, going to folks to your music, and that kind of thing? Yes, ma'am, I'm still trying to take off in the music industry, so... Um, at some point, uh, you pick up a, another case, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Tell the jury what happened. Um, I was at a party, and somebody was fighting outside the, some apartments, and the police gets called, and we end up trying, about to leave the par uh, party, and I fit a description of somebody trying to fight outside the party. And um, so the cops asked me, hey, what are you doing around this area? And I was like, hey, I just came from this party. He was like, okay, well, we heard about a fight going on. Do um, you know anything about it? I said, no, I, I don't know nothing about it. And he was like, okay, well, can I search you real quick? And I was like, yes, sir. You know, he was like, do you have anything on you? And I said, yes, I do. He's like, what do you have? And I said, I have a gun on me. And he said, um, he couldn't believe that I told him that. I was like, he's like, are you sure? I was like, yes. I was like, I'm positive. And he was like, where's it at? And I showed him. And He's like, you know, I have to take you to jail for this. And I'm like, yes, sir. Once Charles is out of prison, he finds himself very quickly in hot water once more. He had been living with Megan in an apartment, along with his grandmother, who was helping to raise their child. And on one evening, an altercation occurs. I was still dealing with, like, trying to blow up this music stuff, and it comes with dealing with females, other females, so I was kind of messing with females on the side of the Here mother. Yes. And yes. she got mad. Yes. And it got brought up in a conversation. We were all drinking. And um, she was kind of arguing with me about it. My grandma got into the mix of the whole thing. My grandma was defending me like, hey, like, if you want to be with him, like, this is what you're just going to come with that. Make him take that lightly. They end up getting into a scuffle. I end up grabbing Megan, and pushing her off with my grandmother. The, her cousin was there because she was living with us. She ends up calling the cops, and the cops come, and we both get arrested. Me and Megan get arrested. And Megan gets arrested too? Yes, ma'am. Charles pleads no contest to assault charges against Megan, and guilty to felon in possession of a firearm. He spends a total of four and a half years behind bars for these offences. 
Whilst he's in prison, he and Megan had talked about getting married when he gets out, but she eventually meets another man and ends up marrying this person, so her relationship with Charles ends. When Charles is released, he says he doesn't know what to do and feels very lost. His mother had moved out of Austin to Irving, and after living in a halfway house for a brief stint, he decides to move in with his mum. Time goes on, and when he approaches his late 20s, Charles moves to Dallas looking for work. He learns of an entertainment district called Deep Ellum and decides to go check it out. Okay, what'd you think, Deep Ellum? I loved it. I was like, man, this is cool, you know? And um, it's crazy because one of the dudes I was um, incarcerated with in a federal uh, penitentiary, he ended up bouncing at the club that I ended up working for. Like, so um, I ended up interacting with him, asking him questions like, hey, like, um, How'd you get to the job, you know? And he was like, oh, well, you need to talk to my, my manager, my boss, you know? And so I mean, that's how you got the job on premise? Yes, ma'am. Charles meets with the manager of the bar, a man called Kyle Williams. Kyle agrees to give him a job, and Charles finds himself working security at the bar. Whilst working this job, he meets many people, but two in particular are the men Dax Stevens and Freddie Chapman. Dax worked security at the same bar as Charles, and Freddie was a frequent patron. He worked there as well as security? Yes. How was he as a security uh, personnel? Uh, cool guy, people okay. person, yeah. Um, and he was just kind of work the door? Not much the door, more than inside. Okay. Um, how was he at his job? Was he good at his job or <laughs> was he focused on other things? Both, everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good in some days, and he focused on talking to him. yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking to who? Women. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's Chuck. He, he is the type that would talk to any woman out there in the bar. I don't say any, but yeah, he talked to a lot of them, yes. Okay. Yeah. And was, Chuck was into, into music as well, he was into rapping? Yeah, he was into music, dressing, women, you know, same thing that I was into. Okay. And, uh... You guys eventually recorded together, is that right? Yeah, we did a song together. I've always loved music. Something about the music that I'm pretty sure all y'all listen to music. So people take music differently. And it was just a, a way to just express myself. Things I've seen, things I've been through, things I've done, or things I've, I've heard about. From, from your, your perspective, uh, did it seem like Chuck's rap career had a chance of really taking off? Uh, no, sir. No. One evening, during work, Charles is approached by his boss, Kyle, who informs him that his mother is looking for someone to do some promotional work, and he believes Charles to be a perfect fit. A meetup is scheduled for them to talk. So you met her, mm -hmm. and uh, how did that go? It went well. Um, she seen me, and she was like, oh, oh you're, the, you're the one I've been hearing about this whole time. And I'm like, if it's good, yes. <laughs> it's me, he's me. And she's like, oh, okay, you know, I give her a hug and, you know, kiss on her cheek. It's, it's my boss's mom, you know what I'm saying? So I respect her, like, yeah, wholeheartedly. Charles's boss's mother is 57-year-old Lisa Dykes, a driven and motivated person who has worked very hard most of her life. She is employed as a negotiator at a law firm, which is known to be a difficult job, and she also has had three failed marriages. Lisa has three children, all adults now. Kyle, Charles's boss, is one, and she has two others, Aaron and Chelsea, who both live with her in Mesquite, Texas. She raised these three children on her own and has also supported other members of her family over the years. At this very time, she actually had her younger brother living with her as he needed some help. Lisa is very close with her daughter Chelsea, and they would often get haircuts together, People had begun to notice a change in Lisa, though, around 2019. She has a blood clot stuck in her aorta. It shatters and spreads across her body, 
but despite the low odds of survival, she manages to pull through. Having come out of this ordeal on top, she claims that she had begun to view life in a different way. Once, when all she valued was hard work and making money, she now wondered what more there could be to life, and people close to her had slowly begun to notice how this affected her. Although, she did continue to work hard, and is described by those that know her as someone who commands attention. Lisa and I both um, did negotiations for the firm. Okay. And uh, as a negotiator, what are, what are your duties? What do you do? Um, we are in charge of calling the adjusters, insurance companies, working out uh, settlements for our clients. It's a personal injury firm, car accidents, stuff like that. I guess what skills do you have to have to be a negotiator? Um, you've got to be really convincing. You have to be able to um, stand firm um, and, and just pretty much you have to be knowledgeable, very detailed when it comes to certain cases. Okay, knowledgeable, uh, well-spoken? Absolutely. Okay, and have to be fairly savvy? Absolutely. Throughout the time that you knew Lisa, I guess how would you describe her? Um, she was, uh, she commanded, her presence was very commanding. Um, she was definitely very convincing. Um, she can persuade anyone to do anything, to be honest. She had, she had very good verbal skills. Um, she had a way, um, a way with words. She could, she could persuade anyone to do anything, in all honesty. In addition to people describing her as a very confident and commanding person, Lisa was always known to be very conservatively presented. Her hair long and looked perfect, and her clothes professional. Lisa would often frequent a hairdresser, Cathy de Leon, and had been going to her for many years. She formed a strong friendship with Cathy. Lisa would tell this hairdresser many things about her life. Somewhere around October of 2019, having known that Cathy was good with makeup, Lisa asks her hairdresser for a special request. Lisa had asked me to do her makeup for a Halloween party okay. uh, that she was having at work. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, did you usually do her makeup? I never did her makeup. And uh, you said in October 2019, she asked you to do a Halloween makeup for a party. Is that she correct? did. Initially, when she called and asked me to do it, um, I told her then, I said, look, it's been a long time since I've done theatrical makeup. Um, and she says, look, I don't want anyone else touching me but you. She says, I trust you. Uh, and she, you know, was very adamant about me doing it. So I told her, I said, look, this is what we're going to do. Send me a picture of what you want. Um, you buy the makeup because I don't, you know, I don't have makeup <laughs> for stuff like that. And let's make an appointment. I'll do like a mock trial. And if you don't like it, then I'll help you find someone that will do it for you. So you went to her house to do this mock trial? No, uh, initially we did that at the salon. Okay. Um, and then I, when, when she saw <laughs> what the results were, she actually ended up loving it. And then uh, she wanted to make the appointment uh, for me to do the makeup the day of um, the party that her, I guess it was her uh, law firm that was hosting this party. On the day of the Halloween party, Kathy goes to Lisa's house to do the makeup. Whilst there, Lisa is excited to show her friend a dress which is in her closet. Whilst looking at this dress, the hairdresser sees something else quite strange. So she goes in the closet and I just kind of like leaned over like in the doorway, you know, just kind of watching her, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, leaning up against it. And I see her walk to the to the back. Uh, she pulls out two garments uh, that were on the right side. Straight across from me, when I turn around out of the closet, I see um, an altar. Um, and it had this big statue thing that, to me, resembled like a Grim Reaper. And I completely, like, freaked out. I didn't want to, like, show how scared I was. But I just like froze when I saw it. 
And so, you know, she, she, she bumps into me. She's like, Kat, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm like looking back at her and I'm looking at this thing and I don't know what to say. And so what did you say? And so I was like, she goes, what's wrong? And I was like, and I looked at, I pointed at, her, I was like, are you into witchcraft? And she goes, well, I dabbled in it. And I, you know, just trying to get myself out of like not sounding scared or not wanting to say anything dumb. I just said, well, okay, girl, teach his own. Just don't put a spell on me. And I was like, come on, we need to like get your hair, you know, shampooed out. And, and I just literally was like, so afraid i just wanted to get out of there as soon as i could the location where this halloween party took place was the bar that her son managed a place that lisa would quite often go to hang out she had become well known by the locals and staff there and it would seem that at some point she had developed an interest in a few of the men that hung around the deep elam area she asked about freedom once or twice yes okay. what was the contents of, or what, what was she asking about it it was more like um, trying to hang out tonight, uh, like, call Freddie, but you can come hang out with me, something like that. Was she interested in kind of pursuing Freddie? Possible, yeah. It could have, yeah. Is that what it seemed like to you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Was she wanting you to kind of connect you and Freddie for them to talk further? For the night, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, so uh, Dex gave me a call and told me to, um, yo, man, come up to her premise. Lisa, she asking about you. She want to see you. And I was like, what? All right, cool. So I pulled up to her premise. Went in. He told me. On, your point on premise was on premise open to the public? No, it was a private party. Okay, and whose private she, party was it? Yeah, that she had rented out, I guess, for her business. Her company rented it out or something. But yeah, it was a Halloween party. So I go in, go to the bar, talk to Lisa. She kind of flirted with me heavily, but she always was kind of flirtatious a little bit. That's kind of her general... Yeah, her energy is pretty strong. Okay. And uh, how'd, that, how'd that interaction go while, you, while she's kind of flirting with you? Well, her face was painted kind of like a skeleton a little bit, I guess with the costume she had on, so I was kind of taken back a little bit. I guess just the energy, I don't know, was kind of hard for me. Just kind of off? Yeah, it was kind of hard for me. Um, and was she trying to have you hang out some other time? Yeah, she kind of told me um, like a proposition, like, you know, anything you want, I can make happen. I see your vision, those type of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you played it cool or shut her down right then? I just played it cool. I didn't take her up on the offer. I'm kind of like, yeah, we'll talk, but. And never followed up on it? Nah, I didn't follow up on it. Okay. Lisa's attention turns from Freddie to Charles, and she takes the man out for lunch at a fancy restaurant. A sort of place that he says he had never really been to before. I think she just wanted to get to know me, you know, just meet up with me. And uh, did you drive to that lunch, meet her there? How did that happen? She picked me up. Okay. Did you have a car at that time? No, ma'am. And where'd she pick you up at? At my girlfriend's house at the time. Did y'all hang out some more? Yes, uh, we had more lunches, more dinners. Did the tone of the lunches and dinners seem to kind of shift from getting to know you to really wanting to get in, to know you, or how did that work? Yeah, we just got grew this little bond. You know, it was we got close okay. to each other. We got comfortable with each other. Okay. Did it uh, become flirtatious? Not at the beginning, but after like three or four lunches and dinners, then it started getting a little. And about three or four lunches in, it, it starts getting a little, what? Flirtatious. Okay. And at some point, did you all have, did y'all get physical? Yes, ma'am. Okay, in what way? Tell the jury about it. Well, um, at the dinner, we ended up having some drinks and stuff. And, I mean, you know, drinks do make you feel more comfortable and stuff. and. So we're just chopping, I mean, talking, getting to know each other more, just talking, talking, talking. And um, as we're leaving the dinner, she's dropping me off at the, my girlfriend's house. And um, she just approaches me like, hey, you know, like, um, she's just like, uh, 
you should let me give you a blowjob. And I'm like, what? You know, she was like, uh, yes, yeah, like, um, I'm hurt. I'm really good at it. Like, you should let me give you a blowjob. And I'm just like, man, you're I'm like, you're, you, you, I'm not taking it serious because I'm like, man, you're, you're my boss's mom. You know, I'm like, mm. she's like, I think she knew what I was thinking. So she was like, look, it'll be our little secret. Nobody has to know. It'll be us. So I was like, okay. So you let her uh, give you oral sex? Yes, ma'am. Okay. She came in one morning and basically said that she had met a guy named Chuck. Um, he, uh, the first couple of times that, that she talked about him, she kind of mentioned kind of laughingly like it was her boy toy. Um, and then after a couple of visits, she continued talking about him. And so I finally, I was like, hey, I was like, so what is the deal with this guy? The description of, of Chuck was that he was a much younger man and she had met him through her son where he worked uh, at this bar. Is that correct? About right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she talked about him frequently. Is that correct? She did. Uh, it seems like she really liked him. Yes. Okay. It seemed like she was pretty infatuated with him. Yes. When she met Chuck, she she kind of started changing. Uh, you, she came in one day, and you know, of course, she had like like longer blonde hair. Always did highlights in her hair. And she comes in one day and she's like, hey, I'm ready to do something completely different. And I was like, okay, well, you know, to most people, to most hairdressers, doing something different is like, we're going to put some low lights in their hair, you know. Uh, but she wanted me to completely shave the sides of her head and do like a pompadour. So if, if y'all don't know what a pompadour is, um, it's basically shaved all around the sides. You have the top that's this longer, you know, quite a bit longer. She started getting a lot of tattoos. Um, you know, she, when she'd come in, she would start one sleeve and then, you know, I'd see her like, you know, like several visits later and she'd started another sleeve and I would always ask her, why are you doing this? One day she came in and, um, and she kind of, grabbed me by the arm. She was like, hey, come to the bathroom with me. I want to show you something. And I was like, okay. So she kind of lifts up the back of her shirt and she's got a tattoo, you know, and I was like, oh my God, Lisa, what are you doing? I mean, where, where this, was this particular tattoo? On her back. On her back. Okay. Yeah. It was a large? Uh, from what I recall, come to think about it, um, came in one day and she had these little gold, they're like little dots, like across the top of her, but they were like on her teeth. And I was like, what is that? What'd you think about this change in Lisa and this, this new young guy and, and what was going through your mind about that? Oh, I just thought it was so odd, um, you know, because, you know, I mean, we're talking, it was just like 2016, she was a completely different person. You know, she's just like morphing into, to somebody that, you know, that I, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just so bizarre. Ms. De Leon, is this kind of the, um, I guess, transition that you were talking about or the big change in Ms. Dykes? Yes. Obviously, the, the makeup here is very muted, long hair, like you mentioned, conservative dress. And over the course of these several pictures, um, you see, you know, kind of bright makeup, um, more dramatic makeup, tattoos, uh, different clothing styles. Yes, ma'am. I just thought that it was all very odd that she, you know, and I, and I guess it was to impress him. I mean, he was a much younger guy. Objection, Your Honor, uh, calling for speculation. As, and, uh, uh, they were a couple, from okay. what I understood. From what you understood? And describe to us, I mean, what kind of couple? Um, it was more of an open relationship type of couple. She was the financial um, Give her, if you will. Did she tell you some of the things she bought for him? Yes. What kinds of things did she buy? Um, she would, um, I know that she got him a car. Um, she did get him a bunch of um, retro type of tennis shoes that costed a lot of money. 
um, clothes, stuff like that. So like sneakerhead type of things, that, Correct. you know, Jordans and things of that nature that make cost several hundred dollars. Correct. When she described uh, Chuck, um, did it appear that she just really was attached to him? Absolutely. And what made you think that? Um, I'm not too sure. It was more of uh, the way she would talk about him, the relationship that they had, the um, how happy it would make her to purchase things for him type of thing. And did she talk about him all the time? She did when we weren't busy at work, but yes. And during that downtime, she's talking about her personal life. Was it, it kind of all about Chuck for a while? Yes. Did you ever come out and talk about his relationship with Lisa? Not really, a little bit. Not really, though. Okay. What was that like? How would he describe it, or what were your observations of that relationship with Chuck and Lisa? Um, the way he described it with me, um, she, um, sugar mama type. Okay. Yeah. Um, would they hang out together in the bar? A little bit, yeah. Did they act like a couple, or did they just kind of be around and things were kind of normal? As if they were yeah, yeah, they, they, they really didn't act like a couple, no. Um, and to you, your observations and things Chuck would say made you think sugar mom. To a degree, yeah. Okay. That it was kind of like the uh, young boy or the woman, she had money taking care of him. The sugar mama aspect. Yeah. Okay, so no, the sugar mama aspect of the relationship. Right. Well, I guess like a few weeks later, that's when um, they was in the parking lot of the building. Of Manor House. Of Manor House, yeah. Okay. And um, I stepped out. He was talking with Dax. Dax was talking with Lisa as well. Nina was there. That was my first time meeting Nina. And um, Chuck had a black Audi. And that's when Dax was like, well, it's supposed to be your Audi. I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, that's Chuck new Audi. He was Lisa. And that's why I was like, oh, okay. That's kind of how I found it. I was like, I guess he took the offer. Yeah. You just heard the name Nina pop up. And I suppose this is as good a time as any to introduce the next person in this situation, Nina Murano. Nina Murano, in 2019, was 48. When she was 16 years old, she met her husband-to-be, 51-year-old Bill Murano. Nina was homeless at the time, and Bill owned a beauty salon in Pennsylvania. Nina goes to the salon looking for work, and despite having no experience, Bill allows her to wash customers' hair. It is said that Nina pursued Bill, and although initially he wasn't interested, things soon changed. Two years later, they get married when she's 18, and a rumor I read through my research, apparently, Nina's high school band performed at the wedding. Bill puts Nina through higher education and pays for her studies. She studies law, and in 2011 passes the bar exam. At some point in her life, Nina meets Lisa Dykes, and they become close friends. I've read different things. Some say they worked in a law firm together and this is how they've met, but Lisa claims that they've been friends for around 16 years. However the two met, they've been close friends for a long time, and Lisa made it very known that she was not a fan of Nina's husband, Bill. Fast forward now to 2019. Nina and Bill own multiple properties and vehicles. The couple spend most of their time residing across two locations a property in Staten Island, and another in Pennsylvania. One night, Bill and Nina have a big fight, and following it, Nina wants a divorce. Bill claims that the fight was over nothing, and he felt very confused by her sudden want for a divorce. Nina no longer sleeps in the bed with him. She sleeps on the floor, and Bill begins to suspect that she's cheating on him. It is reported that Nina is a very intimate and affectionate person, yet she was paying no more physical attention to her husband. As a slight side note, Bill's son does claim that at this time he was in communication with Nina, and the two had planned to be together if she were to ever leave his father. There's email communications to show love poems that Nina had sent to this man. Whilst no longer receiving any attention from Nina, Bill is very upset. November 2019, he goes to pray one night, as he is a very religious man, and on the drive home, he suffers a heart attack. The vehicle crashes into a parked car, and Bill dies. Nina inherits everything, and very quickly sells a few of the properties in the vehicles, which nets her quite a lot of money. 
December of 2019. After Bill's death, Lisa Dykes begins to tell Nina things such as their soulmates. According to Bill's son, who had plans to be with Nina, the two actually called off their fling and never ended up getting together because Lisa intervened. She contacted the son and told him to leave Nina alone. Marriage is discussed between Lisa and Nina, and in the meantime, while still fooling around with Charles, Lisa makes trips out to Pennsylvania from Dallas to meet up with Nina, and vice versa. A few short months after Nina's husband passes away, Lisa and Nina get married. After she mentioned Nina the first time, the next visits that I had with her, it, she only talked about Nina, like I was going, she was going to fly here to see Nina, and Nina was coming in town. You know, it was just like, everything was about Nina. At some point during these discussions, did you just flat out ask her uh, what was really going on there? I did. Um, after her not talking about Chuck, you know, uh, obviously it was all about her and Nina. So uh, one day she came in and she told me that Nina was coming in town. And, um, and I was like, okay, so all you're talking about is Nina. Um, are y'all together? And she goes, well, yeah. And I was like, yeah, but girl, you're not into women. She goes, yeah, but Nina can give me everything that I've ever wanted. She did speak a lot about um, the finances when it came to Nina. Did she ever express to you uh, that this marriage was an arrangement uh, where she was madly in love with her? No, it never did. It never did, ex or she never did express that it was about them being in love. It was more of an opportunity. And what do you mean by an opportunity? Because of finances. Okay. Nina was well off. Yes, ma'am. Did she talk about her sexual relationship with Nina? She did. And how did she describe that? Um, it was more of a... She wasn't really sexually interested in Nina. It was more of Nina being sexually interested in her and um, wanting to have, if you will, threesomes with her and not really Lisa wanting to do so. What about Nina and her marriage? Did she tell you um, whether or not she was interested in, in Nina sexually? Um, no, um, she was not. Um, th there was a visit that she came in and Nina was coming in town and she just had like this disgusted look on her face. She goes, that just means I'm going to have to sleep with her. And did she have those ba same conversations about Chuck? Did she talk about whether she had sexual relations with Chuck and whether or not she enjoyed that? Was that a conversation you had? Um, from what, I mean, the conversations that we did have that, you know, that took place about Chuck, yeah, she always enjoyed that. Okay. Did you meet Nina at some point? Yes, ma'am. And uh, what you think of Nina when you met her? Uh, well, the whole point of meeting Nina was uh, Lisa kind of set it up for me and Nina to like have like intercourse. Okay. Yeah. So when she said that Nina, you know, would be interested too, uh, did you take that as the three of y'all together, or what did you take that as? Um, well, I mean, she made it clear that. She's like, I know that you like us, our, our dynamic of like me buying you stuff and me giving you the sexual favors, you know, for these things I'm giving you, you know. If you think that I'm doing this, Nina would be like doing this for, for real, for real, you know. What do you mean for real? For real? I guess because she was like, she had more money, I guess. So when you met, met Nina, did you guys have sex? Yes, ma'am. And um, was Lisa okay with that at that time? Yeah, I mean, she set the whole thing up. Okay. And at this point, it was kind of, it, it was kind of like her, Chuck, and Nina. You know, they kind of had this threesome kind of thing going on. And this is from Lisa. You're not just surmising this. No. It's Lisa telling you this. Yes. And she says, well, I tell Nina Chuck's not going anywhere. So I kind of took it that... <laughs> 
So you kind of took that as um, yeah, she has a relationship with Chuck, and she has a relationship with Nina, and uh, it's that's that's kind of the information you're getting. Yes. As time goes on, Nina begins to buy more and more things for Lisa. One of these items is a brand new car, a black Maserati. I always get them confused. Mas Maserati? A Maserati? Um, she told me it was black. Uh, she told me it had red seats. Uh, and she told me, she goes, she goes, yeah, I really like the car, she says, but it had red seats and I could not stand the red seats. So I told Nina that she needed to send the car back and have black seats put on it. And I was like, you did what? <laughs> it's like, if someone gave me a Maserati, I mean, if it was like striped polka dot, I would be driving it. I wouldn't. Lisa is living in a house in Mesquite, Texas. And as stated earlier, she lives there with her daughter, son, and her brother. Eventually, she asks them all to leave, and this left quite the bitter taste in her brother's mouth. Good afternoon. Hello. Could you say it uh, and spell your name for the record? And my name is Jimmy Dykes, uh, J-I-M-M-Y-D-Y-K-E-S. Yes, sir. And uh, where are you from? Uh, Somerset, Kentucky, originally. Originally? How long did you live in Kentucky? Ooh, my, most of my life. I don't remember exactly when I moved out, but... Uh, you're having to miss uh, some work right now to be down here, is that right? I'm afraid so. I got like a hundred bucks to my name. Okay, well, we'll try and get you out of here and just back to Florida, okay? Have you and Lisa lived together before? Oh, off and on, like families do, you know, like... She always made, you know, she was the money maker and I was always the peasant, so... When I ran into trouble and uh, mom and dad weren't around, uh, she would sometimes let me stay with her, and sometimes not. It was a lottery. I guess at some point you got you moved to Texas. Oh yeah, huh? Well, with Lisa then. I can tell you about that. Okay. So uh, I was living in Davenport, I think, yeah, Davenport, and uh, I was living with my mom who had cancer. I was taking care of her. Uh, she was real sick, and after she died, I was kind of lost there. I, I didn't have no direction in life. I didn't know what to do, so I didn't have any money either. <laughs> so after she died, uh, she offered to let me live with them. So Lisa said, "Hey, you can come stay with me." Yeah, we weren't really that close, but nevertheless, uh, we were a family. So we did talk together and you know, eat together and things like that. But after that, she kind of just became obsessed with uh, going out and uh, you know being young and. Uh, regressing, having a midlife crisis type of thing, right? Regressing to childhood, trying to get back lost time, hanging out with young people instead of like the family. And basically, from that point on, all us family members were just rapidly but not instantly phased out. Like, so we were just neglected utterly. And instead, she spent all of her time with other strange people we'd never, we never met or interacted with. She stayed out a lot. She starts going out more, these different people, and, and you guys are taking the back burner. No, we're not even in the burner. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't, we don't have hardly any communication. She just does her own thing at that point. And at some point, Lisa bought an Audi? Uh-huh. Yeah. Black Audi? It showed up, mysteriously. Okay. Um, did you find paperwork about that Audi? Yeah, I saw a thing where she bought it, and... Uh, uh, it was it was for Chuck, so. And um, she's Did you ask her to buy you that car. No, ma'am. She offered. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that was a pretty nice car, wasn't it? Yes. You know how much it cost? A little under like thirty thousand. At some point, uh, did you have to move out of that house? Uh, yes, out of the blue. I mean, I, like I said, she had been spending all of her time out and not at home. But one day, uh, she was just like. I need the house to myself. You guys got to go live your own life. Lisa proceeds to tell me that Chelsea's moving to Florida. And I was like, what? I was uh, like, you, you and Chelsea are so close. And, um, and I was like, why? And she says, well, she goes, I'm ready to live the life that I want and I can't do it with her here. And we were like really shocked because that came out of the left field over there, you know? And she was just like, don't worry, I'll help you get started. But, you know, after that, you're on your own. So that was that. So after me and my homeboys helped them move uh, move out, 
course, she's there by herself now, and um, we have a, another dinner. We always have these dinners and stuff, so we have another dinner, and she's like, um, hey, I really think you should move in. You know, like, um, I love what we have. Like, it can still be our little secret. You know, you can still do what you, you want to do, but I, I, I just want you to move in, you know? Like, uh, I think it would be nice, you know? And, uh, of course, I was talking to her about my music and stuff, so she was like, you can build a studio in there, you know? like. There's a pool in the backyard, like, um, I think it will work out perfect. So, at the beginning, I was like, I didn't want to do the whole move thing in because, of course, I had my other, my girlfriend, and just my lifestyle I was living. I just didn't feel comfortable with moving in there, so. So, when you say lifestyle you were living, um, kind of tell the jury what that was. Um, I mean... The club lifestyle, just working at a club and a bar is just partying, night, partying nightlife. Night yes, late night life. I mean, girls. Yes. I mean, you had your girlfriend talking, but you had other girls too that you would talk to. Yes, ma'am. Why did you end up agreeing if you weren't sure about? It? Just talking to my homeboys and stuff. I'm like, hey, man, they all they all knew Lisa too, so you know, I'm just talking to the boys. We're chilling. I'm like, hey, man, I'm like. Bro, Lisa think wants me to move in, and they're like, for real? And I'm like, yeah, like, man, like, what do you think I should do? And they're like, man, why not? You know, like, <coughs> shit, you know? I'm, excuse my French. She, she's already paying for everything. You, yeah. You know, go ahead so and go ahead and take it. So, she's paying for everything for you. Yeah, she just bought me this nice car. Shoes. Like shoes, Jordans, things like that. Oh yeah, we go shopping, out to Clothes. eat. Uh, so you end up moving in, and uh, does she buy the stuff for a studio for you? Yes, ma'am. Lisa was just living this like lifestyle that wasn't this before until we met. You know, like we were just always like drinking, having fun. Like I bring my homeboys over, and like she loves like having this company now. You know, I felt like before that. Her kids and the the brother that was living there, it wasn't. She just stayed like in her, cooped up in her room. Okay. So like now she's free. She could be like herself, you know. So she's drinking with you guys, and, and you're bringing your homeboys over. Y'all are hanging out, all that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a pool in the back. Pool in the back. Had you ever lived like that before? No, ma'am. Ever had a nice house like that? Never lived in a house before ever. And so it was nice. Oh, yes. Uh, were you all still kind of having the same uh, hypersexual relationship that you were having before? Yes, ma'am. You had other women that you talked to. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you bring them over to the house? Yes, ma'am. And did Lisa know that? Yes, ma'am. Um, when you brought them over, did you did y'all all hang out together, or was it just you hanging out with, with the women? I was just hanging out with them. Like, uh, we'll just be in the studio. At that point in time, she was fine with that. Is that fair to say? Yes, ma'am. As far as your sexual relationship with Lisa, I mean, was that something that you were talking about to all of your homeboys and things like that, or is that something you kind of kept to yourself? No, I kept it to I didn't want my boss to find out, you know, that I was having this relationship with his mom. Okay. And everybody suspected that. Yeah, they, they, they would be like, man, like, she ain't just getting you all that stuff for nothing, bro. Like, you're doing something. You know, and I'm like, nah, man, she's just, you know, we just love each other. You know, we just, she's just cool. We're just cool. During the time that he's got that sugar mama relationship with Lisa, is he still doing the Chuck thing with different women? Oh, yeah. That never stopped? Mm -hmm. No? You have to answer out loud, sir, yes or no? No. Okay. Thank you. And um, was he the type that would try and hide his... Uh, Efforts with other women, or was that kind of pretty out, out, out and in the obvious? Out in the obvious, yeah. Did it ever seem to be an issue with her um, that he had these other women? Not that she expressed to me. Okay. Um, was it more about just making sure that he was going to stay with her? Correct. Uh, was there ever a time or a woman that he slept with where she didn't express a problem? The one person she that he could not sleep with was Nina. Okay, when we say sleep with, did that mean sleep with two of them together where it was a threesome? Or was it just if Nina and Chuck slept together alone? 
if Nina and Chuck were alone. Okay. Did she ever express to you that she found out that they had slept together alone? She did. And what was her reaction to that? She was livid. What do you mean by livid? She was extremely upset, very, very angry. Did she express who she was upset with? She was upset with Nina. What things did she say about it? Oh, gosh. Um, she was going to make Nina her bitch. Excuse my language. That's okay. Uh, so that's a direct quote from Ms. Stikes. When she found out about this, she said she was going to make Nina her bitch. Yes. Um, what else did she say? Uh, she was going to make sure that Nina did whatever she wanted her to do. She came in on a Saturday morning. Um, she told me that she had got home from work uh, Friday and that uh, she caught Chuck and Nina in bed together. And um, she, when she was telling me this, she, uh, she was like, I could just kill her. And I was like, wait, slow down a minute. I was like, you you sound a little aggressive here. Um, she said, she goes, yeah. She says, uh, I cannot believe that I caught them in bed together. Uh, and I told her, I said, Lisa, you invited this. You know, I was like, you have let this trio thing go on. Did you not think that it was going to happen? And, you know, after that, she, I mean, I had not really ever seen Nina, uh, I'm sorry, I never saw Lisa, like, upset. You know, she, she was always like, you know, but this particular day, she was very, very upset. Did she mention being upset with Chuck? No. How did she react to the learning that you and Nina slept together without her? She got mad. Okay. And uh, did you get mad at Nina. Uh, how did she treat Nina? She got, she got pissed. She was, uh, she told Nina not to talk to me no more. And so you walk in the house and Nina would be there and what would happen? I mean, she wouldn't even look at me. Like, it was crazy. I was like, what the hell is going on? At some point, Lisa has an argument with Charles regarding the people that he brings around. The cause of this argument was that she had walked out of her room one night to find a strange man she had never met before in her kitchen. When she asks this man who he was, he states that Charles invited him over. Lisa is upset by this because at the time, Charles wasn't home. She speaks with Charles and puts her foot down, telling him, no more bringing strange people over for any reason, full stop. No more men or women unless she approves them first. And he does agree to these terms. Lisa continues to fund his music career and at one point pays for a music video to be made at her place in Mesquite. I'll play an excerpt from it now. October 2nd, 2020, Lisa Dykes has paid for Charles to perform at an event in Arkansas. She booked three hotel rooms, two for Charles and his buddies, and one for her and Nina. They make the four-hour drive over, with Charles and his friends driving in a van that Lisa rented, and she follows behind them in the Maserati with Nina. Charles's friends recall that Lisa drove, and Nina was the passenger. And they also state that at some point during one of the nights, Charles had left his hotel room to go and have sex with the two women. Lisa had recently gotten cosmetic surgery on her thighs and face. The thigh surgery failed, and at the time of this event, 
she was recovering from sutures that had come undone. She said that she was in a lot of pain. When they get to Arkansas, they all prepare for the event. And was Chuck going to perform? Yes. And was Freddie going to perform? Yes. Okay. Were they the headliners? Shit, <laughs> no, 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 they wasn't the headliners. Let me warn you before the judge does. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you, can, you can use profanity if you're quoting someone. Yeah. How'd the show go? It went good. We had a lot of fun. Like I said, um... Like, how did, how did your party show go? Oh, it went good. Me and, me and Freddie performed. How'd the show go? Um, from one to ten, it went about six. How was Chuck's part of the show? About three. <laughs> I'm being honest, yeah. It was about three, so it sounds like uh, the audience wasn't uh, too into Chuck's performance. Correct. Okay. Um, did you get some booze? Yeah, I heard a few of those. <laughs> okay, so some booze, some chuckling, probably. Yeah. And then uh, things turn around when Freddie gets on the stage? Yeah, that was song number two. Yes. Uh, the show went pretty well. I think um, Chuck' performance wasn't that good in the beginning. Maybe he was nervous, you know, um, didn't really practice, I guess, or something. And then our song came on, the crowd kind of reacted. He got into it a little more. Lisa was there. Uh, Nina was there. Was Lisa walking around? Walking around. Walking around the club, able to get, able to move around. Okay. Well, she was, uh, as far as like just moving just around. Just being able to walk. I'm oh, yeah. Talking about oh, you're talking about because of surgery? Yeah. Physical. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So her surgery wasn't getting in the way of her good time. Oh, no. Nah. She, she a soldier. She's she going gonna, she gonna to make it. She says she's a soldier? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well. Okay. She's going to make it? Yeah. She's she, powered through that stuff. Oh, yeah. She, she wants to get something done. She's going to get it done. After the show, the group drives back to Dallas. The night of their return, the 4th, Charles is meant to hang out with his girlfriend, but he blows her off to go to Deep Ellum with Dax. They end up at a club called Punk Society. What did you do with punks? We went in maybe for like 10, 15 minutes. And uh, we had a drink or two. And then uh, we seen this um, baby mama. Who's baby mama? Uh, Chuck. Okay. And then you know Jasmine. Okay, so Jasmine, Chuck's baby mama. Yeah, she come in. No, I don't think so. Okay. Did you see her come in? What, what's y'all's reaction to seeing her walk in? Shit, we gotta go. We went through the back door. When you saw her, what did you guys do? When I seen Jasmine? Yes. Well, we wasn't seeing eye to eye at this time. Why weren't you seeing eye to eye? Just me and my lifestyle, partying and stuff. She wanted me to be there more, and I just wanted to do my thing. So we'll have this little, little so art. Y'all got into arguments. Yeah, little arguments and stuff. So you skipped out of there. You didn't want to talk to her. You didn't want to have any kind of, you know, conversation about that that night. No, I'm, I'm not for the negative energy. I don't want to argue with you, conversate about this stuff. So when I see her, I, I turn around. I'm like, I already know where it can, it can go, especially with her. She has, yeah, she can get real crazy. She can get loud. Yes. Okay. And uh, typically when you, you run into conflict and you run into problems, what is your MO? What is it that you do? I run. You don't face it, do you? No, not at all. And they left out the back door and <laughs> left. He left his drink at the bar and everything, and I didn't see him for the rest of that night. He's more so the type of person that runs away from his problems. So if we did have an argument, he'd just get up and leave and stop talking to me okay. for a long time. Well, as soon as we left, um, as soon as we left Punk, we walked outside the back because I didn't. She was where my the mother of my child was. How the bar set up? It's like right by the front door, so I didn't want to pass her to go out. So we went through the back, and I came through the front, and we're on the the side street. We're just chilling, chopping it up, talking. Dax ends up seeing one of his homeboys. Dax ends up seeing one of his friends. And um, we're just out there smoking a cigarette, talking to each other. And um, Maricela just walks by. Maricela Botello was born in North Carolina and moved to Seattle when she was eight months old. She lived in an apartment with her mother, father, and younger brother, and spent her whole life in this same place. 
She graduated from high school with good grades, no attendance issues, and was known to be a very joyous and trusting person. Maricela was conscious of her health and worked out frequently, and she also competed in track and field. When she left school, she wanted to continue her studies, but her family was unable to afford it. So she began working, and after making enough money, she returns to university to become a nutritionist. Maricela's mother says that her daughter always followed house rules. She never came home late, and when she did, she always communicated with the family about what was going on. Maricela was known to love travel, and in her later years, had begun to travel a fair bit on her own. This worried her mother, but Maricela always reassured her that she would be okay and nothing bad would happen. Despite this though, her mother's concerns would not be calmed, as she believed that her daughter was too trusting of people. When Maricela would travel on her own, she always communicated with her family and friends, letting them know what her plans and movements were each and every day. On the weekend of October 4th, 23-year-old Maricela had planned to go to Dallas to visit her ex-boyfriend, a man by the name of Raul Ortiz. This man was a trusted friend and had known Maricela for many years, developing a strong bond with her after they initially had met in Washington State whilst he was still in the military. The plan was for her to hang out with him in Dallas for the weekend, then get a flight back home at 7am on the 5th so that she could get back in time to make a shift at her job where she was a manager. Maricela was said to be very excited for this trip, and upon arriving in Dallas, she meets up with Raul, and on October 4th, they head out to spend some time at restaurants and bars together. So, let's go to what happened uh, on October 4th, okay? Um, what did you guys do kind of throughout the day? Uh, we had a late um, morning, so maybe 11, 12 o'clock we woke up, had a... Uh, Food somewhere, I can't remember specifically, we had food. Probably a few cocktails. Um, the specifics of that day, I really don't remember. I really don't remember. Uh, what I do know is that uh, more than likely we had uh, cocktails, ate some food, and then got the night started just like any other day. Okay. It's uh, a time of leisure, time for us to kind of let loose a little bit, forget about work, and just you know kind of live a little bit in the moment. When you knew her in Seattle, did she drink and hang out and party? Uh, occasionally, yes. Okay, was she the type to get out of control? No. Okay. Uh, did you know her to be a drug user? No. What happened that led her to uh, be separated from you? Okay, um, I don't remember the specific timeline, but the reason we split up was because I had vomit on my shirt because I was drunk and we went to my apartment and I didn't have the keys to get in it and my roommate was long gone. So uh, I wasn't gonna go out. She, I told her, hey, if anything, if I get into my apartment, uh, let's meet up at Deep Ellum. So she got an Uber, went to Deep Ellum. Chuck was like, man, look at that girl. It was a lady walking in front of Plump to like Brick and Bones. And then she came across the street and we both spoke to the lady and she went to Chuck. That girl was Maricela Vitell. Correct, yes. I let Chuck talk three to five minutes. Uh -huh. How was that conversation? I really wasn't paying attention, but they were giggling and, you know, talking. When she walked past you the first time, could you tell, I mean, and, and you're a ladies man, right? Yes, I mean, ma'am. I mean, you, you know how to flirt, you know how to, uh, to talk to women at bars. Um, was it obvious the way y'all exchanged looks? Was it that kind of look? Yes, ma'am. Where you guys are attracted to each other? Yes, ma'am. Think she's pretty? Yes, ma'am. She thinks you're cute? Yes, ma'am. And then she turns back around to come talk to you? Mm-hmm. What was the conversation like? She was just talking about, um, do you know where to find some weed? Like, she just wanted to smoke. Okay. Uh, y'all chat there for a little while? What kind of, I mean, was it a good conversation? I mean, it was just about the the whole weed situation, uh, she wanted to smoke, and I was just like, hey, like, I was like, I, I got some, you know, like, what are, you, what are you looking for? And she was like, oh, I just, I'm just looking to smoke, you know, and I was like, okay, like, we can smoke. Uh, right. Did you know you were leaving Dax there? Yeah, I texted him, actually. Okay. Told him. And what'd you tell him? I was just like, because, uh, I mean, it's just a guy code to not leave your homeboy, like, for a female, you know, like, plus we came with each other, too, so I'm texting him, like, 
hey man, I was like, man, I got this girl, she wants to, you know, she wants to hook up. I'm like, do you want to, I could pick you up afterwards or something, and you know, like, is it cool if I come get you afterwards or something? He's like, man, yeah, go do your thing, you know. There was footage of them, uh, them being Maricela and Mr. Charles Beltran walking uh, together towards the, the parking lot uh, where we believe they entered a vehicle. Uh, that camera was actually attached to the back of the Punk Society towards the parking lot. Um, I had a bottle in the car. She wanted to drink some more. And so we went to go get some chasers and mixers. We went to the store. And the store's uh, kind of down there that, that 7-Eleven is near the belt. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is this uh, Ms. Botello uh, Valdez and, and uh, Mr. Beltran entering? Yes, ma'am. I believe they enter at about 1.25 a.m., 1.24, 1.25 a.m. And it appears she's just going over to some drink coolers? Yes, ma'am. And that's consistent with the purchase receipt that you all obtained, correct? Yes. And she's got a few items and made the purchase and, and then she left. Maricela is last seen on this video at the 7-Eleven purchasing drinks. She's with Charles Beltran at the time, and it's around 1.30 in the morning. Her flight back to Seattle was scheduled to leave around 7 in the morning that day, and when Raul wakes up the next morning, he notices that Maricela is not there, but all of her belongings are still in his apartment. And I literally slept outside my apartment out in the balcony, like vomit on me, and that's when the next morning I woke up, I, re I was messaging her all, all morning, and she just didn't respond. Um, me being from Texas and me seeing what I... What I've seen in my, my lifetime, I figured something uh, had uh, something bad had happened. How did that make you feel? Pretty bad, pretty bad uh, to a point where I immediately uh, called the uh, I called it in as a missing person because I could tell something was wrong. Yes, on the fifth, she had to take the plane back. Do you recall what time her flight was supposed to get back in on the fifth? Exactamente, no me acuerdo si una o dos, no recuerdo, pero yo le texté para asegurarme que qué horas llegaba. Nunca me contestó. I'm not sure exactly what time, one or two, and I texted her asking her what time she would arrive, but she never answered. At first I thought that she had missed the plane or that she had changed it for a later one, but she was working at Charlotte Ruse at that time, so I began to worry because she had to go back to work. That's when I began to really worry. And it's, was it like her to ever miss work? <coughs> no, no, nunca faltaba. No, no, she never missed. When you learned that she um, did not get on that flight and you couldn't get a hold of her, what did your family do? Um, sí, hicimos como un reporte, un reporte. Yes, we did. We made a report. Mm -hmm. And what was their, what was their kind of response? Uh, exactamente no, uh, no dijeron nada. Um, dijeron que no había por qué preocuparse porque solamente habían pasado horas. Entonces, no, no era como por qué preocuparse, fue la respuesta que nos, que nos dieron. Well, actually, they told us not to worry because it, was, it had just been a matter of hours, so not to worry. That's the answer we got. The next day, my husband and Denise took a flight to here, to Dallas. Do you recall her father coming down with uh, her cousin, Denesley? Yes. We went out uh, looking for asking questions. I believe we left some flyers, but that's the way that looked like. They came here concerned. They could tell something was wrong. I could tell that something was wrong. We went out asking questions, investigating her whereabouts, leaving flyers, talking to people. Uh, but that's the way that looked. Is there any indication at all, Raul, that she had any intent to stay in Dallas? No. Would that be like her at all in the knowing her for the years that you knew her, would that be something she would do? Absolutely not. Con una preocupación enorme y esa fue la, la respuesta que, que dieron. Well, my husband and Jenny came, went to the police department and again, 
they told them she was missing and they got the same answer, don't worry, she's probably partying. Uh, that's the answer they got. How, was that frustrating for you? So, Sí, sí, exacto, porque igual sus amigos me llamaban y me texteaban, es que no me contesta, a mí siempre me contestaba y pues sin poder hacer nada, sin poder hacer nada. Yes, her friends would call me and tell me, I'm calling her, I'm texting her and she's not answering, that never happens and we couldn't do anything, nothing. Maricela had just vanished. She was always very active on social media, and now there were no more posts or stories. Her phone was switched off, and no one could contact her, and her bank account was inactive. The last purchase was the one made at the 7-Eleven to buy drinks, and although there was still money there, she had not tried to access any of it. Charles continues to live life as he normally would following her disappearance, hanging out with friends and partying at clubs. He also spends a week with a woman whom he would have sex with, and she drives him to New Orleans, where they rent a room together. When friends ask him how the night went with that girl that he met from Seattle, he tells them that she was cool, they hooked up, and at some point in the night she left. That's the last he saw of her. Two weeks go by, and the family are still desperately searching for their loved one. News stations begin to take their concerns seriously, and articles are published regarding her disappearance. A young woman was visiting Dallas more than a week ago and went out in deep ballam. Her friends and family haven't seen her since. As Alex Rozier reports, they're desperately hoping someone can help find her. On a Sunday in Dallas, deep ballam is one of the city's most popular spots. Visiting from Seattle after a weekend with her ex-boyfriend, she went drinking alone on Monday, October 5th. Just after midnight, a lift dropped her on Elm Street, but she hasn't been seen since. Following the news reports, authorities become involved and an investigation commences. Law enforcement speak to many people in the area. Some tips come in, with a few of them having possible sightings of Maricela the day after she disappeared. All of these are followed up, and they do seem to be dead ends. The closest one that held any weight would be from a security guard, Floyd Mitchell, he worked at an inn in an area of Dallas that is known to be quite dangerous. He says he spotted someone who looked like Maricela the night after her disappearance at a place called the City Inn. This man is questioned by police about what he saw. Did he appear to be credible in his belief that he saw her yes. there the night before? Yes. And what do you base that upon? Um, I just base it off of, you know, how he was giving me information. Um, one, he was, he was very clear, very adamant that he saw her. Um, also, as a security guard, you know, he sees a lot of people going in and out. Um, so when I showed him the picture, you know, I was pretty sure that, you know, he possibly saw her. Officer asked you if you had seen this young lady, what did you tell the officer? I had seen her at, at, at that date when she, when she came through the building. And were you, were you for sure, were you adamant that you had seen her? Yeah, so I, I seen her, but I won't be, uh, I think that, that, that day, but that's the only time I ever seen her. That's the only time you ever saw her? Yeah. Okay, and what hours did you work back then, I, Mr. Mitchell? 10, uh, 10 in the evening to 5 o'clock in, in, in the morning. Uh, over the course of just, say, a month in October, um, I mean, you may have hundreds of different individuals that you're seeing walking around the city in, coming in, checking in, things like that. Yeah. Uh, is it also known for uh, prostitution, things like that? Yeah. Okay, and, and there's a, a large um, population of uh, young Hispanic females that come through there, is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, small in stature, uh, pretty girls? No, they average. Average? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it states 396, this is the city, is that correct? Correct. So we're not talking about uh, a nice hotel, um, you know, a, a Hilton or a Marriott or anything like that? No, ma'am. And for a person that's never been to Dallas, it, it seems like that would be a, a very unusual place to go spend your time. Correct. The people that you talk to, I mean, they're trying to help, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you been out on calls like this where you're just trying to locate somebody? Yes, ma'am. And, I mean, it's, it's common for people to give tips that just don't pan out, right? Correct. It's fair to say that uh, there's a large population of five foot tall, um, early 20s, Hispanic female, about 100 pounds. I mean, that, that demographic is quite common. Correct. Um, and it's quite possible that these individuals just trying to help um, didn't see Maricela Botello but saw someone very like her. Correct. Although all of these tips don't lead anywhere, the investigation doesn't stop. They locate the surveillance footage showing Maricela leaving Deep Ellum with Charles, and they're able to grab the number plate of the vehicle that they drove off in. It comes back registered to Lisa Dykes, and law enforcement learn that Charles had been living with her at the Mesquite residence. Finding themselves unable to contact Charles via telephone, they look for other ways to get in touch with him. Knowing that Mr. Beltran lived with Lisa Dykes, did you all attempt to contact her? Yes. And how did you do so? Uh, we went to there, we went to her address, knocked on the door, rang the ring <coughs> bell. Uh, no one answered, uh, so we had identified a phone number for uh, my partner, Taylor Page, for the FBI, called her on the phone and spoke to her while we were standing at the residence. Did she answer the phone? She did. And what was your conversation with her? Uh, was trying to be very cordial, uh, just because uh, obviously we're showing up without notice to someone's house. Uh, so we brought a uniformed Mesquite police officer with us. Uh, there's a ring doorbell, uh, so I was kind of trying to, if you have an FBI agent call you on the phone, a lot of folks know that, that there's scams that get associated with that. So we were trying to make our, our presence known and identify who we were. So standing in front of the ring doorbell, kind of waving, showing the uniformed officer that was with us. Uh, and kind of stated, hey, we're, we're here, we'd like to hopefully get in touch with Mr. Beltron. And uh, what was Ms. Dyke's response? Uh, she said that she hadn't seen Mr. Beltron in three to four weeks uh, and asked if I could inquire about the nature of, of their relationship. Uh, and she said she didn't wish to speak with me any further on things with, with that. And were you in the same room with her when she received that phone call? Yes. Um, who purportedly was on that call? Uh, she stated it was an FBI agent. And how did she react to that? Uh, her reaction was that it was um, a fraudulent call, that the person calling her was um, it was fraud, that it, it, there's no way it could be an FBI agent. Okay. Um, did the person leave a name for her? I believe he did. He gave her his first and, and last name. I don't recall what that is, though. And it was this information that she kind of, uh, you know, talked about in the office? Yes. Um, and her, her statement was that this was fraudulent? Correct. Okay, and that was on October 15th, is that correct? Yes. So October 15th, 2020, she says that she hasn't seen Mr. Beltran for weeks, correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And... Did you all ask her to reach out to you if she saw him again, or how did that conversation go? Yes, it was just, hey, if you find information, please contact us. Did you let her know why uh, you were trying to contact him at that time? We did. And uh, what did you tell her? Uh, it was in relation to Charles and who was related to the, uh, we believe we said the missing girl from uh, Seattle that had come down here. We had developed information that she had been with Charles, and we were just trying to find either her or Charles, uh, the last person we knew to have contact with her. You were able to uh, obtain via search warrant and uh, the call detail records of Lisa Dykes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Later in the investigation, we were. When you reviewed those uh, calls, were you able to determine that she had been having contact with Charles Beltran? Yes, ma'am. And these are all. Uh, just in the days after uh, Maricela is seen with Mr. Beltran at 7-Eleven and... Um, That's correct. And also just right after she reported missing by the family. That's correct. Okay. Uh, this is at uh, about 4.20 p.m. that same day. It was about 10 minutes after we spoke uh, with uh, Ms. Dykes on the phone uh, over on Kensington. Uh, she has communication with... Uh, who we later found out to be your wife, Nina Moreno. Uh, and then at, at 426, a phone call was placed uh, to Charles Beltran. By reviewing call records, 
Detectives are able to determine that Lisa had not only been in contact with Charles when she said she hadn't, but she continued to communicate with him following that phone call with the FBI. Furthermore, at not one point did she contact authorities to let them know that she had spoken to Charles like what was requested of her. Police learn that the day after Maricela vanished, October the 5th, Lisa had called in sick to work, and the work day following the FBI phone call, she abruptly hands in her resignation. This is something which confuses her co-workers, seeing as she had not indicated to any of them that she had plans of leaving her job. When did you learn that she had uh, called in and quit her job? On that following Monday. And did you learn what her explanation was? No. Um, I was only told that she tendered her resignation. And did she tender it on that Friday? That Monday. That Monday. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I, the day I heard about it, so I believe it's that Monday. Okay, so you heard about it on that Monday? Yes. Uh, you learned through your investigation that uh, she had quit her job? Yes, ma'am. Um, and that was right after you all contacted her, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. From this point on, Lisa, Nina, and Charles become impossible to contact by law enforcement. They don't answer their phones, and their location is unknown. Charles is labelled as only a person of interest at this point, someone that authorities would like to talk to, seeing as he was the last known person with Maricela. So the search for these three is not yet in full swing. During this time, Nina's home in Pennsylvania goes up for sale. Nina's neighbour in Pennsylvania, Jamie Scarpa, is the real estate agent who is going to be handling the sale. Jamie says that she knew Nina quite well, and remembers her to be a very quiet but sweet lady one who lived next door with her husband Bill. Jamie would quite often visit the house to have dinners with the couple, and at times they had bonfires in the yard. Jamie says that around the time Bill died, she noticed a change in Nina. She was out travelling a lot more, and Nina would ask Jamie for her help to feed the cats at the house, and to bring the mail in. The request to sell the house came as a surprise, seeing as Nina never indicated that she wanted to sell the property. In fact, quite the opposite. Nina loved the home, and purchased it specifically because her father lived in an adjacent house, and she wanted to rekindle a relationship with him. Nina is out of town on October 12th, when she calls and asks to sell the house. She says it's incredibly urgent, and it had to be listed immediately. Unfortunately, Jamie cannot do this seeing as she would need the keys to the house to take photos, so she had to wait for Nina to come back. Nina also doesn't offer an explanation for why the house sale is so urgent. On the 1st of November, Nina calls and asks for another favour. A black Audi is going to be delivered to Jamie's house, and she needs it to be stored, but it's a very important for a cover to be placed over the vehicle. The second week of November, Nina comes back to Pennsylvania with Lisa, and they meet up with Jamie to go over the contract for the house listing. When Jamie enters the house, she says that she's quite surprised by what she sees. The house which was once open and full of light is now dark. All windows and doors are covered with black sheets, and light is barely getting in. They go to the dining room table to discuss the contract, and Lisa places an audio recording device, then sets it to record. Jamie mentions that this feels very awkward for her, and she was unsure of the purpose for recording this conversation. Although Nina talks about setting the price for the house, all other questions are directed through Lisa. Whilst Jamie is visiting the house for this conversation, she notices something strange. We, uh, we toured the house, and there was a closet that's next to the foyer. In the side of that large closet was like a life-size, I guess you'd call it a statue of a skeleton, and it was wearing like a robe, and it was holding something like this. There's like a mat on the floor in front of it. She made it like pretty clear, buyers are not to go in there, you know, don't, don't open that door. And what did they do in front of that? Uh, kneeled. Uh, after they kneeled, um, did you, I mean, were you standing there while they kneeled, right with them, or where were you? I was not in the closet. Okay. Um, what did you think about that? I was ready to go. Yeah. Were <laughs> terrifying? Scary. Uh, did you ever know Nina to uh, be into that sort of thing? Yes. Um, she originally lost connection with her father due to religion, but I didn't know what the religion was. Okay, so you, you're just kind of surmising that maybe it was this? Yes. Okay, but you've never seen any, anything like this before? No. 
and you didn't know her bill to have these types of statutes in their house before? No. Um, at some point, did you, in December, did you receive, a, I guess, a photograph from a buyer's agent about some concerning things in the home? Yes, we did. Um, a buyer's agent had said that a buyer was concerned about something that they seen, and they sent me a photo. It was like a smaller, what I would call, Grim Reaper statue, and it was on like a small side table with candles and like little cups of alcohol or money in the cups. The buyer wanted like an explanation if they were going to buy this house that was scary to them um, i didn't know what to say so and you kind of let the buyer's agent know look that's her religious beliefs i can't really talk to her about it or right. anything else like that yeah i never brought it up with nina either. okay um and at some point you uh did your own personal research on what that statue was i that did right? yes and what did that statue in your research uh, represent um uh, the santa morta statue was angel of death that they had up. Nina is adamant that the house must not sell for a penny less than $300,000, seeing as the place was her baby, and very quickly they get an offer. Unfortunately, the offer is much less than they were asking, and Nina rejects it. But later that day, she calls Jamie back and says that after speaking with Lisa, they accept, as they just want to get rid of the house. A month after Maricela disappears, October 31st, Police obtain a search warrant for Lisa's house in Mesquite. They find nothing of interest, and nothing seems out of place. But as the investigation progresses, another search is effected on the property in December of 2020. During this second search, things at the house are quite different. It looked like Lisa was in the tail end of a move, as there was next to no furniture left in the house. The detectives found this to be quite strange, seeing as earlier in October she had just renewed her lease for another year, and made no indication that she was planning on moving out. Officers who searched the house say the state that the place was in. It gave them the impression that whoever lived there had left and moved out in a hurry. Furthermore, although the carpets looked like they had been cleaned, using Blue Star technology, a blood patch is located on the carpet, just underneath the window in the room where Charles would sleep. The carpet is cut out and sent off for analysis. Um, the DNA profiles obtained from those two samples were from a single female that matched the DNA profile of Maricelo Botello Valdez. And that statistic is less than one in 10 trillion. And what this means is that if you were to randomly select an individual and compare them to this DNA profile, you would have to have more than 10 trillion people before you'd expect another person to match that DNA profile in the same way. From October 2020 until late March 2021, Lisa Dykes, Nina Morano, and Charles Beltran spent time moving between Louisiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Mexico, Florida, and Utah. The three mostly traveled together, but at times Lisa and Nina would separate from Charles to take care of unknown matters. It is believed that they were working on the sale of the house in Pennsylvania, selling their cars, and moving furniture and other assets around when they would do this. When they planned to cross over into Mexico, they realized that Charles doesn't have a passport and is unable to get one until his backlog of child support is paid off. Lisa and Nina pay it off, which totals close to $20,000, and then promptly submit passport paperwork for him. His passport is approved, and they all cross the border into Mexico together. At some point during this time period, Lisa and Nina also change their surnames both to Beltran, Charles's last name. Charles continues to post on his social media, but uses videos and pictures that were taken a while ago, making it look like he's in locations that he's not actually in. He also posts stories about his innocence, and releases another music video called Person of Interest, which again essentially claims that he's innocent in all of this, and has no idea what happened to Maricela. The video has since been removed from the internet, and I was unable to find it. After spending time in Mexico, around January of 2021, the trio moved to Florida. Whilst here, Lisa and Nina leave Charles alone again, and while he's on his own, he meets a woman by the name of Nicole Beauchamp. Um, I was grocery shopping, and you know, I saw him, he saw me, and um, he approached, you know, he approached me, and he started talking to me and telling me he's not from here. And I'm always intrigued by a foreigner, you know. So I was like, oh, you know, he, when he says he's not from here, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, I want to show somebody around. I'm just a friendly like that. 
and that's how we met. His eyes were very, um, very like welcoming. Um, at first, I didn't, I didn't meet up with him at first. I just don't meet up with guys like that. So it took a while, like probably like a week of him being like, oh, let's go out to eat. And I, you know, I was like, eh. But then um, I was like, you know what? He's like, it's, let's go out and have lunch. I'm like, okay, it's the daytime. We're gonna go to a public place. So I, I went. We hung out every day after that. What did he tell you his name was at first? Antonio. And you believe that at first? Yeah. Well, you know what? No, I don't believe anything any guy says. <laughs> so um, I was like, yeah, right. You know, I did, I did think it was weird. I'm like, oh, so he just moved here? He told me he had moved here from um, Pennsylvania. Was it physical quickly or? No, we were friends at first. He didn't try anything. That's one of the reasons why I felt so comfortable hanging out with him. And this is why I don't ever meet up you know, with any guys because there's two, um, you know, they try to come on to you quickly, but he was nothing like that. He didn't try anything at all. Um, eventually, we did, but it was because I gave him that okay kind of you know, body language. You know, I gave him the okay, but at my first, no. We hung out for like a week and he didn't try anything, never. Um, from there, you know, started being intimate with each other and we were just together every day from there. It was awesome, it was great. So, how many times did you go over there when it was just the two of you? Every day. Okay. Was there a time where some other people showed up? One time, he was like, um, he calls me, he's like, oh, um, you know, you can't come over. He's like, I was thinking I could go to your house. I was like, no, I don't bring no guy to my house, you know, I have a son. I was like, no, I don't bring men to my house. And he's like, um, no, my friends came out from out of town, you know, and I was like, he's like, yeah, I don't want anybody over here, you know. His friends came, they just showed up out of nowhere. I was like, okay, and that was that. We didn't see each other, or I never went to his house again for like a week. One day he's like, oh, you know what? You can come. He's like, you can come over, but you have to be quiet. I don't know. You're loud. I like, talk loud, laugh. You know, he's like, you're loud. He's like, I don't know if you could be quiet. I'm like, I can. And he's like, you know, um, he's like, all right. So I remember him picking me up and he was just very weird in the car. He didn't want to, when we pulled up to the house, he was like standing there, you know, looking down um, like a fr I don't know what he was thinking about before. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, um, he's like, no, no, come on, let's go. I remember him going up to the front door and he stayed there for a while, like listening before we went in. But we go into the house and um, I didn't see anybody when I went in there. We went straight to the room. So the next morning when I wake up to leave, um, I walk out. I was like, oh gosh, the walk of shame. <laughs> I was like, oh. so I walk out and um, I see two women. I saw um, this white woman and then I saw another one who had black hair, like curly hair, you saw her hair. And you know, when we get back outside, I'm like, um, who are these women? And he's like, oh, um, one, one of them is my cousin, that's her girlfriend, they're lesbians. And that was that, you know, I believe what he said. And then at some point, uh, did you find out that uh, Antonio was not his first name, the name he even went by? Yes, so I was staying there with him and I went to go use the bathroom. When I went to use the bathroom, I found an ID in the bathroom. And I was like, oh, I was like, let me, I'm like, oh, I'm violating this person's privacy, but I'm going to look at it anyway because, you know, I'm a, I'm a single woman. Who could these people be? So I, I look at his AD. I see his name. I was like, okay. I went back to the bed and right next to him, he was sleeping, knocked out. I Googled his name and I saw all this stuff about a missing person, a woman who, all this older woman who ran with him. Um, nobody had been, they only mentioned, Lisa and him, and the, 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 it was a, he was a person of interest and a missing person. So of course I'm like panicking, freaking out in the room. I thought that the girl was, the girl that I thought I saw them with when I read the article, I thought that was the girl that was missing. So I saw her hair only on the couch. So I'm like, oh, that's probably the girl and she probably wants to be here. So I really didn't think much, of, even though I was freaking out, this was happening. I didn't think much of it because I thought that that's her. And then, um, I just, I never told him anything though. I kept it to myself. I was scared too, to say anything. I was just scared at the moment. But I guess you still continue to see Chuck. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was fine in the way you, you and Chuck's relationship still, even though he's giving you this middle name, this is his name. Yes. Yep. Everything. Um, obviously now you've got these concerns seeing this missing person, but you think the person you saw that you now know is Nina. Yes. You think maybe that's Mr. that's her? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, at some point, did Chuck leave Miami? So um, he started saying that he was going to go to Tampa, 
out of town with his friends. Charles leaves Florida and goes back to Dallas. Here he meets up with the mother of his child, Jasmine, and he stays with her for a few days. When she questions him about being a person of interest in this Maricela case, he lies to her and states that he's already spoken with detectives and everything has been cleared up. They're no longer looking for him. She believes his story, and he soon tells her that he needs money and wants to go to Utah where he can work with her brothers. She agrees to help him out, and she drives him from Texas up to Salt Lake City in Utah. Once she drops him off at her family home, she returns to Dallas. You spend the night there, did he kind of seem like everything was normal? Yeah, okay. everything was fine. He wasn't acting unlike like he normally, he was telling me about going to all these different places and working and seeing Niagara Falls. It was almost like he was on vacation. Uh, did he tell you where all it went? To Miami, to New York, to Pennsylvania, to Mexico. And uh, so that that was kind of the conversation that evening. Yes, right? ma'am. And you were under the impression that he had already spoken with detectives. Yes. Now, uh, you later found out that wasn't true. Correct. correct. Whilst Charles is in Utah, Late March of 2021, almost six months after Maricela's disappearance, a woman out in Wilma, Texas, about a 30-minute drive from Dallas, is trapping feral cats in a wooded area. Right off the road from where she's setting up the traps, she uncovers human skeletal remains. Uh, human remains were discovered in a wooded area of Wilmer, and investigators now tell us it is Maricela Batello Valadez. She was last seen one night in Deep Ellum more than five months ago. Valadez lived in Seattle, but flew to Dallas to visit her ex-boyfriend and decided to go out alone one evening. The remains were all congruent with coming from the same individual. Uh, there were no repeat elements, which is one of the things that we look for. If there's two, two left arm bones, uh, two skull fragments from the same area of the skull, um, anything that could give us an idea that we, we actually have two individuals, not one. And in this case, there was uh, no indication that we had multiple individuals. There's no inflicted trauma to the skeleton. Okay. So the evidence that you're able to see from changes to the skeletal remains are uh, weather, ground, and animals. Correct. Okay. Um, and do you have any way of knowing how long those remains were set out there? See some of those kinds of changes? I don't. When the remains are in that sort of condition and they've been impacted by scavengers, uh, there's really not a reliable way to make a time since death estimate. Uh, we're missing uh, several ribs. Uh, you have 12 paired ribs on uh, each side. Uh, you're missing the sternum or the, the breastbone, uh, the manubrium, which is the top of the sternum. Uh, we're missing the upper spinal column, so the thoracic and the majority of the cervical vertebrae. Uh, one of the cervical vertebrae is shown in this image. Uh, and then you're missing the shoulder complexes, so the scapula, uh, the arm bones. The conclusion is, is that the anamortem um, and postmortem evidence matched in sufficient detail to say that it's from the same individual. So you're able to say the records you received of Maricel Vitello Valdez match what was recovered uh, by the ME's office. That's correct. A day after the remains of Maricela are found, Nina Morano is arrested outside of the apartment she was staying in at Miami, Florida. During the arrest, Lisa flees the scene and runs out of the apartment before authorities notice her. She then contacts her brother. Uh, yeah, she called uh, insanely early in the morning and I was mostly asleep. And she said that she wanted money to come up to Orlando because she wanted to meet with her lawyer up here. And uh, I told her I didn't have any money, so <laughs> that wasn't going to work. And so uh, I told Aaron about it, and I, I think he sent her money. I don't, I, I think he did, but I'm not really sure. That next day, did you hear uh, about anything? Well, the same day, later on in the day, the police showed up and told us what was going on, which we were, I was floored by that information. I, in my, all my years of life, I would never dream such a thing could transpire. I never thought that would happen. But, uh, yeah, the next day, uh, the next day we, we heard of what happened there. That she got arrested mm -hmm. in Orlando? Uh, yes. As you heard, the day after Nina's arrest, 
Lisa is located in Orlando, and she's arrested as well. Police at the door, open the door, please. Sheriff Office, open the door. Do it now, we're coming in. You see your hands? Step on out, walk back up. Walk up. Thank you. Turn around and face the wall. Put your phone down, put your phone down. I know. Okay, just put it down. You can talk to him Put it down. She's tracked by her cell phone activity, and when she's arrested, they found a new cell phone that she had purchased a few days earlier in a mall. This cell phone has numerous text messages to people she knows, and some of these messages from this device were of great interest to the police. Lisa sends a message to her son saying, This is my burner. I'm turning off my other one so that it doesn't ping. As the messages go on, it seems that Lisa is asking her son for someone that they know's credit card. In her words, I need you so that we can use Val's debit card for these reservations. I'm feeling exposed. After Nina was arrested, these messages are sent to a contact in her device called Lover. Lover's number is identified as Charles Beltran's phone. These are the messages to Lover. They got warrants for capital murder on all three of us. Supposedly they found her, but the attorney said they are building the case. They don't have evidence. They are guessing. Continuing on with the messages to Lover, Lisa begins to talk about Nina following her arrest. These messages say, I'm hoping she keeps her shit together. I need to get out of this state real quick. I have no idea how much is in there until I get her shit. I'm trying to go to our favorite spot I wanted to live for a minute. You think you can get to me there, or do I need to come get you? Following the discovery of Maricela's remains, and the arrests of both Nina and Lisa, Charles's ex-girlfriend Jasmine learns that she had been lied to when Charles had told her that detectives were no longer interested in finding him. I got a call from the U.S. Marshals. And they were looking for Chuck, right? Yep. Was it then that you realized that he wasn't completely honest with you about talking to the yeah, I was pretty spooked. Um, while I'm actually on the call with the U.S. Marshals, one of my friends sent me the article that her body had been found and he was wanted for capital murder. So this was all at the end of March, is that right? L- yes. Okay. So he's actually in Utah uh, when you get the word that Maricela's body had been found. Yes, ma'am. At that point, he, he told you what had happened? No. Uh, had he indicated to you that he was uh, tired of, of traveling and going places and, and wanted to kind of settle? Yeah, he wanted to settle in Vegas. I called him. And what did he say? I was telling him, like, I was ma- asking him to tell me the truth because of what are you doing? And then you're at my family's house. You're, you're going to get all of us in trouble. And he was like, he was in the process of getting ready to tell me what was happening and my dad's on the phone and they're like well you know he needs to get basically he's going to get out of there he wanted to go get a hotel to get away from them while we're on the phone he says somebody's knocking on the door but the peephole is covered i'm going to call you right back it's at this point that charles is also arrested whilst on the phone with jasmine charles is taken in and detectives begin an interrogation at first he has a number of different stories regarding what happened to maricela Initially, he tells the police what he told his friends. That being, he had sex with her in his car, then dropped her off somewhere in Dallas so that she could get her flight home. The story then changes, that she went into his house with him and they had sex there. They both fell asleep, and when he woke up, she was gone. He believed that she must have gotten an Uber out of there. As the pressure is put on, he tells a story where he woke up to Lisa and Nina coming in the room whilst he and Maricela slept. They seemed irate, and Lisa even had a knife in her hand. Charles says that he freaked out and ran out of the house before he could see what happened. When he spoke to Lisa again, he had no idea what happened to Maricela, and it was not discussed further. Finally though, after about 45 minutes of questioning, he lands on a story which he says is the truth. Well, the conversation we had in the car, she was telling me that she had a room, and um, I was trying to go back to her room, but she told me that she had somebody there. She didn't want to go back to her room and stuff. She was like, I prefer going to your spot. 
So you take it back to your spot. Um, you get there. Um, were Nina and Lisa awake at that time that you're aware of? Uh, I don't know if they're awake or not, but I, I know they were there. I don't, I don't know if they're awake or not. Okay. And you got the drink in, listening to music, hanging out. Um, what happens next? Fall asleep? No, we end up... Y'all have, have sex? Yes, ma'am. Okay. After you have sex, what happens next? Fell asleep. Were you aware that she had to leave the next day to catch a flight? Yes, ma'am. Was it your plan to wake her up and take her back wherever she needed to be? I mean, at that time, we wasn't even thinking about any, any of that. We just, you didn't have a plan? No, no ma'am. Okay. Um, so you're asleep. Tell me what happens next. I wake up to her screaming, saying, help me, help me. And I, I look up and... Uh, it's just from all the movement going on in the bed. That's when I wake up and I see Lisa on top of her. What is she doing? She's like with the knife coming down like this. And once I notice the knife, that's when I push Lisa off of her. What happens when you push Lisa off of her? I mean, I, I, just my reaction was just to push her and I pushed her hard. And her and Maricela like tumble over and fall towards the where the window is at right there. Uh, Lisa still got a hold of her. As I get up, I'm still trying to process what the hell is going on. I see Lisa still grabbing her. I, I jump over the bed and as I come over to the bed, I'm trying to pry Lisa off of her, pull her apart. And, um, and so as, as I'm pulling them off, it's like Lisa just kind of like let go and she just tumbles over. She tumbles over and she falls on the bed. I mean, I look, that's why I look, I look behind me. She falls on the bed and I, I look towards Lisa and I grab Lisa and I pin her to the wall and I'm like, what the F is, what the F are you doing, you know? And she was like, I told you not to bring any more girls over here. What else? I told you not to bring any more girls over here. Why are you disrespecting us? I do everything for you. And she was just like, you need to get your little... Say it. Your little bitch and y'all need to leave the, Leave now. Y'all need to leave. And what were you doing? What were you saying? I, I was just like, that's all you had to fucking say, you know? Excuse my French. I said, that's all you had to fucking say, you know? And as I, I turn around, as I turn around, I'm... I'm fixing to tell Maricela, like, let's go. And she's just, she's just there. Just there? Just lifeless, like, gone. Just blood, all, blood all over her. Like, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. So what, what did you do? I mean, I just woke up to this, so it's still like, I'm not even registering everything. I, In my mind, I'm like, this can't be happening, this can't be happening. I, I, I go to the restroom, I come out of the room, and I come to the restroom, turn the light on, I throw water on my face, trying to like, tell myself like, wake the up, you know, like this is not happening. And Lisa's just still standing there, like just looking at her, just staring at her, just laying there. Staring at Maricela? Yes, and I could I could hear her saying something like I can't recall what she's saying, but it sounds like she's saying like what what like what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? And um as I come in like I see the whole scene again and I, I yell at Lisa, I'm like, Lisa, Lisa, and she's like not snapping out of it. She's just like staring. I'm like, Lisa. I'm like, Lisa, we have to call nine one one. She was like, No, like like, hold on, think, like, think about what you're doing before you do it. And to me, like, registering that, I was just thinking about the whole scene. Like, I'm with her. I'm the last one with her. She's in my room. You know, it looks like I did something. So I'm like, you need to figure this shit out. You, you told me to fucking leave. Like, you did this shit. Like, you need to, 
I'm gone. You know what I'm saying? I can't deal with this. Like, it was just so much to deal with. And I put my clothes on and grabbed my stuff and left. When I told her, I was like, I can't deal with this shit. She was telling me, like, grab, Le grab Nina, grab Nina, tell Nina to come in here. And that's when, like, right when I was leaving, Nina, I could see Nina in the bedroom, just in the bed. I mean, from what I seen, she she looked spooked too. I, I, she just looked like real spooked. Like, I'm, what pretty, you I'm pretty sure she heard what the hell was going on. And what did uh, what did you say to Nina? I was just like, hey, I was like, Nina, Lisa wants you. I was like, I'm gone. I'm okay. leaving. Like, and that's when I left. Cell phone tower data shows that throughout the night, starting from around 1.50 a.m. on October 5th, Maricela's phone was located at the Mesquite residence along with Charles, Lisa's, and Nina's devices. At 8.09 a.m., Maricela's device communicates with the same tower for the last time and then never reconnects. It was either damaged or switched off. At 8.55 a.m., Charles's device can be seen heading away from the house alone, and it stops at an oil change center. This is consistent with his story, that he left the house in the morning panicking and didn't know what to do. So he sat in his car for a while outside of his girlfriend's apartment. He then composed himself somewhat and drove away to get an oil change, shortly before driving to his friend Dax's house. The same day, October 5th, the day that Lisa called in sick to work, between the time 6.36 p.m. and 7.38 p.m., Lisa and Nina's devices can be seen traveling together away from Dallas, and they visit an area in Wilma, right next to where Maricela's remains were found. After hanging around this area for a brief period, the two devices can be seen making their way back towards the house in Mesquite. Charles says he didn't speak to Lisa or Nina for a few days following what happened, and he cruises around the next few nights with friends. Not yet knowing that she was a missing person, some of these friends would ask him about that girl from Seattle that he had met. Well, I asked him, I said, yes, what y'all do? You take her to the hotel? Because being that she was out of town, I was thinking that maybe he would take her to the hotel. And he just said, oh, no, nah, we just messed around in the car, got some mixes, and I dropped off in Deep Ellum. So he tells you dropped her off in Deep Ellum. Right. Okay. Find some girl out about Deep Ellum and to go have some kind of relationship and be... I wouldn't say that it's like the norm, like it happened every day, but you know, you meet people. Just not out of character. It's, it's not out of character, yes. So there was nothing to press on about that? It was, uh, okay. No, it wasn't like a celebration moment, like you go or nothing like that. You ask him about the yeah, girl? Yeah, yeah. I was like, man, why was that girl last night? You know, he was like, he was nonchalant, like, man, nothing really, just got some head. Went to the store, got some mixers. Then got some head or whatever, messed around, just, just his words. And then um, he dropped her off because she wouldn't let him take her back to the hotel. And he just dropped her off by like Baylor. Homeboy to homeboy, he asked what we did that night. And um, I told him, you know, we had sex. And um, after that, I dropped her off. Why didn't you want to tell that? I don't know. How you tell somebody you just witnessed a, somebody murder like that, you know? A few days following what he says he saw happen to Maricela, Charles says that Lisa reaches out to him and gives him a phone call. What was the conversation? Uh, they were just asking me, uh, where have I been? Am I okay? Come back home. Everything's okay. They said, it's back to normal. Everything's good, just come home. Did they tell you what happened to Maricela? No, ma'am, but, I mean, I, I figured. Why didn't you call the police then? I'm scared. In the days after, I mean, we're talking, you know, several days after, you're just going about your business. Did you ever think about calling the police later down the road? I've, I've, I've always had it in the back of my mind, but I always thought that it could be pointed to me. Why did you think that? I mean, they're attorneys, they have good jobs, they don't have no record. I me, mean, I look like the bad guy. I was scared. 
Charles goes on to explain how, at some point over the next coming weeks, he managed to meet up with Lisa and Nina whilst they were out of Dallas. When he catches up with them, he describes it as though the women were taking him sightseeing. How did that make you feel going sightseeing? I, I, was, I was pissed at them. I was so mad because I was like, I'm trying to figure out this. I'm, at the, once I got linked up with them, I'm trying to figure out how to clear my name from this because I'm, I'm, I'm literally kind of blackmailing Lisa now. Like, hey, you know what you did? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are you sending me out here? And she was like, just chill. We're going to we're gonna get all this clear for you. We're going to get all this clear. They mentioned they wanted to go to Mexico. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, was this a vacation? Was this to stay? Did you know? Well, um, I mean, to them, it, they were portraying it to me like, hey, like, just to clear your mind so you won't think about stuff and watch your back this whole time while we're trying to figure how to clear your name from this. We're going to go to Mexico where, of course, like, I guess my face won't be over there. Got to Miami. How long? Do you remember how long that took to get to Miami? Some days. Some days. We would just stop, rent a hotel, and keep on going. For we'll rent a hotel for the night. It's. I mean, so you guys were on the run. Yeah. Seems like. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, to, to me, Miami? to me, it was me on the run because my face was on the thing. So they were just comfortable with trying to go out to eat and all this stuff and I wasn't. The reason I stuck the reason I stuck around is because like I said they were they were already promised me to clear my name from this and um we were gonna part ways because they were gonna sell this house. So money was involved too, which is selfish of me. I, but I wanted this money too. So every time we've met what have I told you? That I wanted from you. The truth. Um, did we ever have a deal in place <coughs> for you to testify in exchange for your testimony? No, ma'am. You, you've been trying to talk to me for a long time, and I've been denying it, actually. And when you say denying it, I mean, what are you talking about? I had two attorneys before this, and they they reached out to me that you wanted to to talk, and at that time, I just wasn't. I was still being selfish. Not trying to tell the truth, not think about the family that lost their daughter. So, with time though, as I get got close to talking to my little girl, it just made me think about them a lot, and that's why I reached out to Myra. I was like, man, if you could reach out to you, I would love to to bring out the truth. You haven't been the best father as far as showing up, correct? Yes, ma'am. And. Um were you aware that Maricel's father was here in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. And you know, he's the kind of father that was there every day. Every day for his daughter. You know that, right? Can I approach the witness, Charlie? You may. Now, you may not have been able to stop the murder of Maricela Vitello, but you could have stopped this, right? Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. What do you want to tell that man back there, sitting there watching this trial? <clears throat> What do you want to say to him today? There's no different relevance to what he wants to say to him. At this stage of the trial. Lisa and Nina were released on bail with electronic leg monitoring devices sometime around October 2021. The two women quickly busy themselves creating an LLC, applying for lost passports, and applying for visas in Cambodia under the guise of scouting local artists for their newly created company. On December 25th, 2021, Christmas Day, Lisa Dykes and Nina Morano's leg monitoring devices stop transmitting signal. I noticed that um, both Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morano um, did not have any GPS on their devices. Um, it appeared that um, their devices simultaneously 
um, dis were disabled. Um, and when I looked further, one device went offline at 7.28 and the other device went offline at 7.32 a.m. on the 25th of December. Do you, have, or do you believe that um, two devices could die within minutes of each other by just failure to charge? Um, it's, it's very unlikely. I would say it would be either physical damage to the device itself or submersion of water. Now, if I were to physically damage the device, would that send a tamper alert? It could, but it might not either. Um, but that's the point of the tamper alert, is that if I were to try and physically damage the device, that it should send a tamper alert. That's correct. But if I were to submerge my device in water, are they, are they water resistant at all? Um, so yes, yeah, so to an extent. Um, uh, defendants are told that they can shower with their devices, but they cannot take baths, go on the pool, in the hot tub. They cannot submerge their device in water. I called both Ms. Dykes and Ms. Morano. I emailed them. Did they answer? No. Did they call you back? No. You emailed, you had good communication via email. Did they email you back? No. I'm a special agent with the FBI, and I am currently stationed in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I'm the assistant legal attache. So working FBI matters in Cambodia, we cover Cambodia and Vietnam. It was approximately January of 2022 when individuals from the FBI Dallas office reached out to me and said that there were two women, two individuals who were suspected of murder in the Dallas area and that uh, travel records indicated that they were currently in Cambodia. The FBI begin an intensive search for the two women. This agent's testimony is quite detailed on what measures were undertook to locate the women, but essentially it boils down to bank records, using ATM bank records, then following CCTV footage which shows the two women travelling in a vehicle, then tracking that vehicle's registration. Lisa and Nina are traced to a coastal town in Cambodia called Sianakville, after about two months since they fled the United States, the women are arrested again. Put handcuffs on them, and once they were in handcuffs, uh, one of the first things that Lisa, like, actually not one of the first things, Lisa looked at me and said, what jurisdiction do you have here? I was taken back by that comment, um, and but at that point, I just responded to her saying that the Cambodian National Police Office, that we would have, that she and I would have time later to discuss, and I can explain things further, but at that point in time that the Cambodian National Police Officers had to do their jobs. How did you take that comment? Like I said, I, I, was, I was taken back. It was not something, um, I mean, technically I don't have law enforcement authority, but I wasn't the one doing the arrest. It was the Cambodian National Police, the numerous Cambodian National Police officers that I was with, so I was definitely surprised and, and taken back by that comment. Uh, what was one of the other things that you found interesting? There, the amount of cash. So, because the ATM transactions had indicated that they had gone to the bank several days um, before prior to this encounter, this arrest, uh, so they had cash with them. Uh, unfortunately, some of the Cambodian National Police thought that they would help themselves to some of the cash, um, but uh, Lisa and Nina were very um, careful when they were going through every item that was taken that belonged to them, and when the Cambodian police came to the cash and said it was about $300. I believe it was Nina who said, no, no, that's not right. There should be close to $6,000 there. And sure enough, um, my translator had heard from, uh, overheard two of the police officers say, dude, put it back. So one of the Cambodian police officers did try to take the cash. All three individuals are charged with capital murder, but following cooperation from Charles and Nina, both their murder charges are dropped and they only face tampering with a corpse. This charge still can get them 20 years behind bars, but not the life without parole that Lisa faces. Lisa Dykes is the one who goes to trial for the murder of Maricela Bateo. Throughout the trial, the defense would say that Charles is a liar and his testimony absolutely cannot be trusted. And during this time, he told you that he had talked to the detectives, but he made it appear like they had cleared. Correct. So he's a, he's, 
he's a pretty good liar, isn't he? Because he had you believing this. Yes or no? Yes. He's talking to you that he's just making it seem like he's just traveling the world. Yes. Not a care in the world. Yes. But then you later find out that this girl was, was brutally murdered. Yes. And he was involved in the murder. Yeah, to a certain extent, yes. You, somebody hanging around with every day, right? Yes. Any reason for him to lie to you? It shouldn't be, yeah, no. You don't know whether he was lying or not, do you? No. Hard to tell when he's lying, is Correct. He was very loving, nice, very convincing, wasn't he? Very, yes. Very charming. Extremely. I mean, you, you're still attracted to him, right? Yes, I am. So you felt safe with him, right? I felt safe, yes. And he's very convincing, right? Uh, I mean, you could call it that. Even though he wasn't being completely truthful with you? He has every reason not to be truthful. Excuse me? He has every reason not to be truthful. So he had reasons to Of lie, course. And that makes it okay? Um, it doesn't make it okay, but it's understandable. So he did lie to you, right? He, of course he did. Okay. Mm -hmm. At some point, you find out that, the, that this missing girl was actually dead, right? Right. And you still don't stop talking to Mr. Bell trying to do you. I didn't. No, I did not. So you say that he's just a friend, right? That's right. Uh, but are y'all singing love songs each other? Uh, we sing songs, all types of songs. Love songs, don't you? Like what? Love songs. I don't know, you tell me. What's, what mm -hmm. songs are y'all singing on, on the jail calls? Different songs that we like. Like we what? Well, just songs that are on the radio, different songs. Um, I went to the Beyonce concert, sang some of her songs. All types of music. He's, a mu he's into music. Do you agree with me that you are obsessed with him, aren't you? No. He's uh -huh. manipulated you like he's manipulated so many other women in his life. Yeah. He never manipulated me. He doesn't need to manipulate me. I'm not easily manipulated. But you were? No, I was not. I'm a good judge of character. When I see somebody's a good person, you, I realize it. You're a good judge of character. You, you, you meet a man at the grocery store, right? That's right. Uh, he tells you... This Judge, I'll, I'll pass it with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You told so many versions. I just want to make sure that we cover all the different versions that you told. You understand what I'm saying, right? Yes, sir. Because you, you told different stories, right? To different people, correct? Yes, sir. And you will agree with me that you never said anything to anybody about Lisa being jealous until uh, Detective Romero brought that up. Remember her saying that? Yes, sir. She said that, didn't she? Now who said it? Detective Ramirez. Detective Ramirez was the lead detective on this case, and the defense make it no secret that they have many issues with her work. They say that she conducted a poor investigation, and that she was so focused on Lisa being guilty that it led her to be blinded to what could have really happened. A huge point of contention is her interrogation with Charles. They say that Charles hadn't mentioned anything about Lisa being jealous of him sleeping around with women. He hadn't even said any of that to his friends. This is consistent with the testimonies of his friends. They say that Lisa was always aware of Charles's womanizing ways, and she had no problem with it. But all of a sudden, when the detective puts the idea in Charles's head, asking him whether Lisa was jealous of any of these women that he brought around, at that point, that's when the story changed, and Charles says that Lisa was indeed jealous. You remember telling them that uh, you need to go ahead and talk to you because if something else comes out, uh, he's going to look bad. Remember that? Yes. And this is all before he goes into any version where Lisa is supposed to stab Marcella, right? Correct. Up to this point, he hadn't said anything about Lisa stabbing Marcella, right? No. Uh, you remember Ortiz specifically asked him, hey, you're a felon, right? Yes. He and then that's when he tells him, well, this is capital murder. You can get life without parole, right? Remember that? Yes. All the death penalty. Correct. Do you remember asking him about um, were there times when you brought the girls over and Lisa would get mad? Yes. And, and that's 
before he started talking about Lisa being jealous, right? I just remember he, he said he was jealous. Ma'am? I remember him saying that she would get jealous or get yeah. mad. After you said, has there been times when you brought girls over and Lisa would get mad? Correct. Then he started talking about Lisa being jealous, right? Yes. On top of claiming that the detective placed the idea in Charles's mind to blame Lisa, the defense also highlight a number of issues with the investigation. To go through them quickly, they say that there is body camera footage that is missing. The footage contains an interview where police talked with people who said they have seen Maricela, and it was the detective's fault that this footage was nowhere to be found, as she had failed to correctly store the video files, something that she admits to doing. They also state that Charles claimed he went to one of his girlfriend's houses after leaving the Mesquite residence, following meeting Maricela. This girl, whose name is Carmen, very quickly after Maricela vanished, moved out of her apartment, and no one knows how to contact her. She is from Australia, and it is believed that she returned there, but no attempts by law enforcement to find her were ever made. Furthermore, the apartment where she lived was never searched. Yes, yeah, she was out of town. She was no longer in Dallas. We she didn't, we, we left Dallas, right? Yes. But, more importantly, at some point in one of these versions, mm -hmm. the, I think it may have been the final version, after he's putting everything on Lisa, he tells you he goes to Carmen's apartment. Doesn't he? Yes, he does. And you guys don't talk to Carmen, do you? No. Y'all don't find out what apart where her apartment is, do you? No, we try to get help with the FBI to locate her. Okay, but as far as the, her apartment is what I'm talking about, yes. you got Mr. Beltron having contact with a missing person, admitting that he went to this apartment, and we do nothing to check to see if there's any indication that Maricello also was at that apartment, do you? No, sir. Overall, the defense points out the fact that the detective lost her position following this investigation. This what I'm saying is, you, you testified before you dropped the ball on this case. Didn't yes. You? So there was evidence that the defense could have used that could have aided in our defense that we didn't get. Everything was corrected before this trial started. You were the, you were the leader detective, right? Correct. But not anymore, right? No. You were demoted, correct? I was transferred. So you are demoted? I'm still in my same rank, not as a detective though. Okay, you're just not a detective anymore. Correct. And that's largely because of the video thing that happened on this, this case. Yes, sir. The defense also has issues with physical evidence. For example, Maricela's skull was found to be missing four teeth, and the dental expert testifies that it looks as though these were not extracted professionally. It is speculated that Charles became aggressive with Maricela and knocked her teeth out, then killed her before disposing of her body. The blood sample found in his room is of great interest to the defense as well. There were two other DNA signatures found mixed in, and both return an unknown male and an unknown female. They don't match Charles, Lisa or Nina. So again, it is speculated that Charles had a group of people with Maricela that night, and whatever occurred did not involve Lisa Dykes. To wrap their argument up, Lisa Dykes is put on the stand to testify in her own defense. Go ahead and uh, state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Lisa Dykes. And can I approach you? You may. Uh, you have a very soft voice, so I want you to make sure you keep your voice up and speak sure. into the microphone, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So the members of the jury can hear everything you have to say. Can you do that for me? Of course. We've heard a lot of what Charles Beltran had to say, and now it's your opportunity. Lisa's testimony is extensive, and she speaks quite a lot, answering questions with very long replies. I'll do my best to summarize what she has to say down into sections so that we can cover her version of events effectively. Essentially, she states that there was absolutely no sexual relationship between her and Charles at all. He was nothing more than a business investment for her. She saw potential in his music and wanted to support him so that he could make it big. In turn, 
If he were to become successful, she would receive a portion of his earnings. I met him in April. He reached out to me at some point, and he reached out to me to make connection. And it was primarily for someone to fund him in his career choices. Um, he, he actually talked to me from April on through the time whenever I moved the children out of the house in August. But he presented himself well. He also had had a fairly successful career in Austin. Not like what you heard here that was played. It was actually something where he was invited to a couple of locations and he was working with other people in his career. So perhaps they were the more talented aspect, but he had a more successful kind of career choice. But were you, you know, initially, again, was it a love interest thing? No. Chuck was and continued to always be a business interest that went sideways. After explaining that she moved Charles into her house so that she could build him a music studio and further support his career, she goes on to talk about how she learned that he was a violent and dangerous man. This theme of him being a dangerous person crops up a lot throughout her testimony, and it begins with her mentioning that this is the reason why none of her family members are here in court to support her. I would not want them and don't want them exposed to having the same issues that Maricela experienced. Chuck is a violent man, and I don't want anything to happen to them. Chuck had brought home a dog. What type of dog? He was a pit bull mix. Yeah. And the dog's name was uh, uniquely Charles. So we had a dog. Uh, who took care of that dog? I did. Did, did uh, Chuck take care of the dog at all? The dog hated Chuck. Absolutely. Um, when he brought the dog home, he said that he wanted it for some protection in the house, extra protection in the house. And he initially, the dog was okay with him for a while, but Chuck used to beat the dog. So the dog started to get to a point where he was growling every time Chuck was around. He was not having Chuck around. He was a bouncer at the club. And at some point, he got fired, didn't he? Yes, he did. For his activities there at the club, right? Yes, he did. Not just being aggressive with the women. No, not just that. Okay. Issues he would have with other patrons. He was fighting every night, and he was a bouncer. So he was getting into altercations and fights every night. And is this something he would brag to you and Nina about? Yes. Okay. okay, but I do want to ask you, Chuck did carry a gun, didn't he? All the time, every day, any place that he went. Okay, so you hear all these women talk about how sweet he was. Is that the 50-50 the he's referring to? Well, it's not the 50 I got most of the time in the later days, but he could definitely appear to be. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, what, what, did you say anything about uh, him potentially being involved in trafficking? I had suspicion that Chuck was involved with trafficking. Why? Because on a couple of occasions, like two separate ones that I can think of in particular, I found a suitcase at the house that was like in in the living room area. It was just like a, a carry-on. And I, I looked, like, I looked to see what it was, and it was full of young girls' clothing. It was small sizes, young girls' clothing. The video that um, I uh, forced the, the jury to watch, um, did you pay for that? Yes, I did. Uh, that video and the way he's acting on that video, is that Chuck? Yes, it is. All the time. That's not a show, right? That's, that's yeah. who he really is, isn't That it? really is him. Oh, did he brag about pulling trains on people? He did. Now, what, what, is, what, what, is, what is pulling the train? Um, he particularly seemed to like having a friend of his, a male friend of his, come over to be with the girls that he brought home. So. That's basically two guys and a girl. And they would brag, he would brag about it? Absolutely. Well, did that make you jealous? No. Is that Charles Beltran? It is. Does this photo have significance to you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much an indicator that he and his people are watching. Is that, was that threatening to you? Very. 
Did you believe that he and his people were always watching? Yes. Before they get into the brunt of her testimony, the defense will go into a series of questions to get her side of the story explaining things that other witnesses spoke about regarding her life. I'll go through them piece by piece, and it starts by covering her relationship with her wife, Nina Morano. It seems like the witnesses that have testified are making it seem like you were depending on me. No, that's actually not true. I've been a litigation paralegal for 34 years, so I always had a glass ceiling in my income. Nina actually made um, about the same amount of money that I did, and she's an attorney, so I was making quite quite a good salary at what I do. Okay. Like, I do the litigation work, so it, it pays well. This notion that you were with her just for her money, is that true? No, absolutely not. Like, um, we both brought money to the table. God blessed us both in being able to make a good living, and it was something that the marriage made us more solid financially, but I, I didn't need Nina to pay bills. Nina didn't need, need me to pay bills. We're together primarily because we, we actually love each other. I've known Nina for 16 years today. I knew Nina for 13 years before we got married. So we had been best friends that whole time. Well, we love each other. We love each other like sisters. Like this is a unique relationship. Um, I think we might think about marriage, Nina and I do, maybe differently than the average person. Not every marriage is based on sex or, you know, that physical connection. Nina and I are supportive of each other in every way other than that. Like, we love each other like a sister. We love each other, like, truly. Like, anything that Nina's going through, I want to help her with that. Anything I'm going through, Nina wants to help me with that. Lisa says that there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why they sold the house in Pennsylvania, and that most definitely it was not a decision made because they were on the run. Nina had decided to put the house on the market in like April or maybe even March before she and I got married. So she couldn't afford to borrow the money because she was upside down at the house in Staten Island. She was trying to sell it so that we could get out from underneath that mortgage because it was large. So she couldn't afford to, to fund the money or to borrow the money to fix this house to put it on the market. So whenever we got married, one of the first things that I did was fly up there and we borrowed the money so that we could fix the house, put it on the market and sell it. As you heard, Lisa denies having a sexual relationship with Charles. And this notion that she had begun to change her image so that she could impress him, or be more like someone that he would want, she says is ridiculous. Instead, there is another reason for why she had begun to make these changes to her appearance and lifestyle. In her 40s, she had a blood clot, which shattered in her aorta and blocked all of her major organs in her body. For 30 days she was in hospital, and it was life-threatening. Doctors told her children that she had a 25% chance of living, and if she did survive, they would need to cut off her legs from the knee down. Somehow though, she survived with all of her limbs intact, and for 10 years she was all good. The blood clot returns, six years prior to this trial. She goes back to hospital, and it's the same situation. After surviving this second time, she had begun to re-evaluate her life. She was spending all of her money on her children and family, and she wanted to start putting money towards her retirement. She doesn't want to work all the time, and she wants to move back to Florida. The goal was actually to move her whole family back to Florida first. Then, after she settled some large cases in Dallas, she would head over there and meet them all. In regards to the changing of her appearance, she states that the hair change was actually her hairdresser's idea, not hers and the cosmetic surgeries were a wedding gift from Nina. She goes on to describe how these cosmetic surgeries took place, and ultimately how the one on her legs to remove extra skin had failed, causing her significant pain and discomfort. Explain to the members of the jury where, where your injuries were. They're exactly in the groin. Like, it's right at the top. Like, they make a Y incision at the top of your groin and then it goes all the way down the inside of your leg to a couple of inches above above your knee. The place where I had no skin was right in the crotch. Right, so right, right in this th area. Right there. Yep. And would you have to have that bandage? There were four layers that had to go on. Alright, all the way down. Uh yep. To, to cover it to about 
at about two inches, three inches above your knee. Okay. With this particular injury, where this was, and pain factor involved, this is a 10, and having a baby is 5. Okay. So that gives you an idea of what that was in dealing with it. Although not explicitly stated, these details about her injury highlight how difficult it was for her to move around, and how the idea of her attacking Maricela in the way that Charles says she did would have not been possible. Moving on, Lisa says that her decision to leave her job, although it may have looked abrupt due to her not talking to anyone about it, it was actually a decision that she had made for very understandable reasons. She had long-standing issues with her boss regarding pay, but on top of this, her work was being affected by the response her body was having to the surgeries and the pain medications that she was taking. I was at that point in time doing the negotiations for the firm, so if I couldn't make my nut, which that's a strange term, but if I couldn't meet the quota of settlements that we had, like the money for payroll was going to come out of saved money back. So I needed to be there with the surgery. I could not be there like I needed to be. And I also, like my focus wasn't as good as it should be whenever you're taking pain meds like hydrocodone, which I was taking at the time. Okay, and did that have a lot with, to do with uh, you uh, eventually, eventually leaving? It did. The trip to Arkansas, which Lisa funded for Charles's music, is also gone into in much detail. The trip to Arkansas was unplanned. Whenever I had this procedure initially done, Dr. Armijo had told me that the surgery would be, my legs would be the best they were going to be at three weeks. So this was exactly three weeks post the surgery. Now, I promise you I wouldn't publish these, yeah. right? Yeah, they're, but, I apologize in advance, they're, they're not pretty. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about the extent of the injuries you had to your thighs, uh, these photos depict that, do they not? Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Dykes, you're not saying that uh, on October 1st your leg was uh, opened up like this, right? Oh, it was. Okay. It was? It was, yes. Now, you heard... Um, and everybody said you were driving. Is that true? No, I was in the passenger seat and it was reclined. Okay. So who was driving? Dina was driving. Okay. Uh, when y'all are down in Arkansas, uh, did he have come to your room and have sex with y'all? Absolutely not. Um, but did he come to the room and have a drink? I think he might have. I think he did. She attempts to explain away some of the more strange elements of this case regarding the Grim Reaper statue and the skeleton in the closet that other witnesses said they saw in her houses. It starts with her saying that this was in fact Charles who owned the statue, and it was a part of his faith. He did um, talk to me about Santa Muerta and said that he had learned about it while he was in jail, and then he practiced. So he, he practiced the religion. All right, and so the altar that we see in your home in Mesquite belonged to him, correct? It did. In fact, it's in the same, was that in his room or in the one of the other rooms? It's in the closet in his room from the picture. Her husband, Bill, had kind of a weird sense of humor. So in this closet, there was a, like a Halloween skeleton that's full size, like human sized. And he had put, because they were Mormon, a Mormon religious like piece of clothing on it. It's, it's like a, a long white robe, but it was bundled up in like on the floor of the closet. It's not anything else. So it was just a bunch of stuff and storage that we had in there that we kept locked including paperwork that we didn't want shown to people coming to look at the house. Well, you heard the, the neighbor from uh, Pennsylvania said y'all were kneeling in, kneeling to it, praying to it. Remember that? I remember her saying that, and I also have no concept why she would have said it. We never did that. Did that skeleton have anything to do with Santa Morta? Absolutely not. Lisa also has an explanation for why she and Nina changed their last names to Beltran. My last name is slang, basically. A dyke is slang for a gay woman. And it would be just 
a horrible name for us to take as a last name for us. Pennsylvania allows you to change your name to any name that you choose to whenever you get married. So when we looked at the names that we wanted to take as a last name, Dykes is right out of the picture. So Murano is not really a name that we wanted to take because of her relationship with Bill. So we looked at other names of people that were around us or, or names that were of interest and Beltran was an interesting name. It means Raven in Spanish and it has a history and it's just, it was a better name. We asked Chuck if he had a problem with us taking it. It was not in any kind of connection to him, but it was just a name that appealed to both of us, so we took that name. So you didn't take that name because y'all were obsessed with Charles Beltran? Absolutely not. All right, let's move forward. And now, to start getting more into the main part of her testimony, Lisa has an explanation for why her and Nina's phone were located near the spot where Maricela's bones were found. According to Lisa, Nina was waiting for some important documents to arrive via FedEx, and seeing as they didn't show up when they were meant to, they begin to look into other ways to acquire them directly. They go to a FedEx facility, which is quite a large one, and it's located near Wilma, not too far from where Maricela's remains were uncovered. As far as this facility was concerned, y'all were picking up. Yes. Or Nina was picking up. Nina was picking up for Mark, yes. They had sent her a package that she needed. Okay, and she had been trying to locate that package. She did try, um, but it's so hard and she needed it really quick, so like tracking it electronically wasn't working like it needed to. So it just made sense to go someplace and get some help with it. As far as the towers that they showed, that you saw the state show, if you were in that area, would that explain why your phones were pinging in that area? I would assume so. Did you ever go to, what is it, um, I think it was 36? 3600 post oak and drop a body out? No, sir. The defense would dive into the major details, according to Lisa, of how everything unfolded following the months after Maricela's disappearance. I want to fast forward to the early morning hours of uh, October 5th of 2020. Was Nina there? Yes. Were you and Nina there in your room asleep? Yes, with the dog. Um, on that day, did you ever come come in contact with uh, Maricela? No. When Chuck arrived there with her, according to the phone records, mm -hmm. in the early morning hours, did you ever know he was there? No. Anything unusual about him arriving at your house in the early morning hours? No. You heard him say that... Uh, at some point, you came into that room and you stabbed Morissette. Did you go into that room and stab Morissette? No. Did you struggle with Morissette? No, absolutely not. No. Did you argue with Chuck about Morissette? No. Had you ever met Morissette? No. Lisa explains that following the FBI phone call you heard about earlier, she did indeed contact Charles to tell him that the FBI were looking for him and that explains why she was in contact with him. She's a busy woman and had a lot of things on her mind, so she figured by telling Charles that the FBI were looking for him, he would reach out to them and the situation was resolved. She believed law enforcement didn't need any more information from her. So after you talked to the agent, you immediately called him? I called him. I said there was a FBI agent that showed up at the house who called me and said that he's looking for you. Here's who it is. That's pretty much what was said. Okay. Um, did Charles go into detail about Marcel at that time? No, he did not elaborate. He didn't say anything else about it. He was like, okay, he took the number, supposedly, and that was that. Did he seem worried at all? No, not even a little. Not a concern in the world? No. That the FBI was looking for him? No. Also, following that call with the FBI, Lisa states that someone had leaked information online that she was connected to Charles, and even a picture and description of her home address were posted on the internet. Once this had occurred, she had begun to experience harassment, threatening phone calls. The tires of her car were slashed whilst parked at her house, and due to all of this, she feels so unsafe that she decides to leave her home in Mesquite 
and go move in with Nina in Pennsylvania at the house that they had both planned to sell. Then, from there, the plan was always to move to Florida together to start their new business. How did um, Charles Beltran end up in uh, Pennsylvania? Um, he knew about the property. He knew that we had the house in Pennsylvania. He knew that we had listed it on the market. So he knew where this house was. So we're in Pennsylvania. We had not actually talked to him. He ended up in Bethlehem, which is just outside of East Stroudsburg where the house was. He called us and told us that he was there. So y'all didn't send for him? No. He just showed up? He just showed up. When he showed up, was he asking questions about the house? He wanted to know if the house had sold. Obviously, he was after the money. He wanted to know if the house had sold. He wanted to know where we were in the house sale. Okay, but uh, what are you putting up with Charles Beltran? Charles is a lot more aggressive than what you have been told. He was really bad as far as aggression goes. Um, one night in particular, he was trying to get a hold of me for money. Whenever I woke up in the morning, I had 99 missed phone calls from this man. 99. And he also, at one point, like, I had locked the door. He, his access into the house was through the garage door because he would come in through the garage. There's a, a door that went between the kitchen and the garage. So I locked that door. He didn't have a key to it. It really made him mad. When I got home that night, the door was broken, like the actual door itself was split, the door, and he broke the frame to the point where you couldn't fix the latch on the door. So that was how mad and aggressive he was. Okay, let's, let's talk about Mexico. Why did y'all go to Mexico? Was that y'all's idea or his? Yes. Chuck wanted to go to Mexico. Chuck wants something? Y'all make it happen? We made it happen because I didn't trust that I would not end up like Miss Modelo okay. and Nina, like both of us. Or our families, for that matter. So you did what Chuck asked you to do? Absolutely. As we move through the testimony, she is asked why did she run as Nina was being arrested? My concern was us being able to have enough time for me to get an attorney, attorneys lined up for us, for us to be able to get something prepared before both of us were arrested and likely not to be able to do that. And is that what you did? That's exactly what I did. You got out of there? Yes. And eventually you got arrested? I did. She's further asked to explain the text messages between her and Charles following Nina's arrest. Specifically, the one that says, I hope Nina keeps her shit together. Okay, let me ask you, why, why were you concerned with Nina's mental health? Um, Nina's an attorney. Nina has spent an incredible amount of her time to be an attorney. <laughs> She is actually a Cambridge scholar. So Nina really has invested everything into this. This case, in and of itself, has destroyed us. The fact that they have brought this charge against me and Nina has ruined our lives. But ma'am, I'm going to ask you about why when Nina was in jail in Florida, did she try to commit suicide? She, was on, on suicide watch? she was on suicide watch because of these things, because of this. So yes. And so, when you see the text messages and you're saying you're hoping Nina keep her shit together, is that what you're referring to? Yes. I, I did not want her to, to have a meltdown and try to commit suicide or effectively be able to do that. Lisa would then be asked to explain herself and her reasons for disabling the leg monitors and traveling to Cambodia. Well, what, what give me that is, at some point y'all cut those monitors off. We did. Tell them about the jury why. We cut the monitors off because we both felt very much persecuted in this case. I, I do as I'm sitting here in front of you today. I feel very much like Nina and I have been completely singled out in this case in a way that it should not have been. Like you consider I was 57 years old when this incident happened. I did nothing but work and raise children all my life. There's I mean, why would I even be suspicious in this? I've never been arrested. I had no criminal record. Nina's an attorney. 
she had never had any kind of, of criminal record. Like, we lived a life that was pretty much upstanding. We hadn't ever done anything like this. Well, this let me ask you. Okay, you said you felt persecuted. Yeah. So why, why, or why Cambodia? Cambodia was a good place for asylum. Cambodia was a good place for us to find a new life, for us to live, for us not to have these situations. Um, we looked at it. We looked at citizenship. We entered Cambodia legally. We didn't do anything illegal. We did everything you were supposed to do to come into a new country and try to nationalize or to get asylum there. Okay. You were trying to get asylum because you felt persecuted? Absolutely. And were you afraid? Yes, absolutely, both. For your safety? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, at the time, right before we left and flew out, there was a black pickup truck that had started to park right outside of our house. And it would move on the street, but it was always there. One day, I went to the window. Me and Nina were cooking in the kitchen, and this black truck is parked right outside our kitchen window. Whenever he saw us, he left. But it was definitely a man, and it was nobody we knew personally, and somebody that shouldn't have been there. And did that give you concern? Absolutely. So when you went to Cambodia, did you do so out of necessity? Yes. And in, in our feelings, absolutely. Did you stab? Morisot? Absolutely not. Did you have any reason to stab Morisot? Absolutely not. Did you have some anger crazed breakdown because you were so obsessed with, with, with Charles? Absolutely not. As one would expect, the state thoroughly cross-examines Lisa up on the stand. So. Just a minute, I mean, you mentioned um, all these threatening things and you were advised if there was anything that went wrong or anything else like that, you could either talk to Julian LaPere, your uh, ELN person, and you could talk to uh, the judge about what was going on and you never did that, did you? No. Okay, so you never told him about any of these issues that you had going on supposedly during your time on ELN, right? You're a smart enough woman to know you could have told them any of that and they would have done whatever they could to make you feel better, right? Which issues are you speaking uh, of? I'm talking way? about this truck that's outside. I'm talking about uh, the people uh, supposedly harassing you. You could have talked to the judge about that, right? I feel that would probably have been ineffective. But you didn't try, did you? No. So, uh, speaking of Chuck, you mentioned, uh, I mean, you, you made it a point right off the bat to talk about how violent he was. Again, I'm looking through all of this stuff, and I don't see one police report that you called in on Chuck the entire time that you all lived together. You I didn't do that, did you? I would not have. I would not dare to have done that. He is not the kind of man you make a police report on and, and have anything come of that that's good. Chuck has a lot of tattoos, doesn't he? Yes. In fact, the one that's right there on your wrist, if you'll show that to the jury, please, the and we're talking about the one right there on your wrist, right? Mm -hmm. This one right there. Right. You're aware that Chuck has that same tattoo, doesn't he? He does. Yes, he does. Okay. So you are a 57-year-old woman investing in a rapper's career. Um, you don't have any personal relationship at all, but you get a matching tattoo. The tattoo is actually the logo for the business that I started for him that I'm invested in, math class. That's what the tattoo is. And it's the logo for that. Now, Dax, Freddie, you know them, right? I do know them through the class. They've been to your house plenty of times, right? They have. Okay, and, and I mean, they talked about how everybody knew everybody knew that you were in a relationship with Chuck, right? They talked about that. They said that, yes. Okay. This Miss Scarpa just made up this fact that you guys uh, knelt there, right? Miss Scarpa had said what she said for whatever reason she did, but it was not true. Okay. Okay. And you know that she testified that you all had several personal conversations at work. You recall that conversation? Right? I remember her testimony. Okay. So there's a uh, person number two this line, right? Seems to be Olivia had some thoughts that weren't exactly correct. Okay. You didn't have any personal conversations with Kat either, did you? 
We did have personal conversations. I'm sure so you did. told her about Chuck? Uh, I did tell her that Chuck was there in the house, yes. Okay, and you told her about your, you talked about him all the time, didn't you? No, not all the time. Uh, you talked about him frequently to her, didn't you? When she asked, I answered her. And of course, if he was this mean, awful, violent person, you could have told her, you would have told her that. Not necessarily. But you told her about the sex, didn't you? No, I didn't. You didn't tell her anything about you guys having uh, any kind of sexual relationship? No, I didn't, because that wouldn't be true. Now, you made it a point on direct yesterday to tell the jury, um, you know, Chuck's a violent man, didn't you? I didn't. And you were so scared of Chuck that after you met him, uh, you bought a car, right? I, I did buy a car, yes. And you had to move into your house after your daughter and son and brother moved out just within weeks, right? Yes. You invested in his rap career. I did. Right? You were so scared of him that you got matching tattoos with him, didn't you? I did. You were so scared of him that you brought Nina, your best friend of 14 years and now wife, around this man, didn't you? I did. You uh, were so scared of him that you chose his last name after getting married to Nina, right? I chose Beltran. And you were so scared of him that when he had a rap show in Arkansas, you paid for the rooms, you paid for the, the van, you paid for the slot, and you and Nina went up there to the rap show, right? I did. You were so scared of him, you actually paid off his child support so that he could go with you. To Mexico. We did. You actually left him in Mexico, didn't you? We did. When you all left him in Mexico, you left him there for a couple weeks, didn't you? We did. And yet you went back and drove from Pennsylvania all the way down to Mexico to pick him back up, didn't you? We did. You did a lot of things to make sure that you stayed in contact with Charles Beltran, and even yet though you had the opportunity when he went to Mexico to leave him there, didn't you? We didn't feel that we really had any kind of choice in this. Ever. With the trial wrapping up, both sides would have the opportunity to present closing statements. The evidence in this case does not corroborate Charles Beltran's this last version that he gave. The evidence doesn't corroborate any version that he gave. Version after version, version to death, version to Fred, version to all the girls that he came in contact with, lie after lie after lie. Nothing corroborates it. He's a liar, he can't be trusted. I'm gonna ask that you not uh, further uh, to warn this, this perjury is all it was. My opinion, but my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what evidence came from that witness stand. And the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is the evidence does not corroborate uh, Charles Beltran's version of the horrific murder that he's trying to tell you about. We're going to ask that you find Ms. Dykes not guilty because that's what we believe the law and the evidence dictates that you do, but more importantly, because she is not guilty. Thank you. Ms. Docks took the stand, and when you assess witness credibility, the first thing you need to do is see, is their testimony making sense? Is it backed up by anybody else's testimony? And in this case, she swore on direct and swore on cross over and over and over again that she had no romantic or sexual relationship with Charles Beltran. Yet in her phone, that she is on talking to someone when she gets arrested in March of 2021, March 26th, his name is Lover. She chose that name for him. Yet she sat up there and lied to you. Of course, she starts with Charles Beltran's a liar. We'll get to his testimony in just a minute. But the Charles Beltran's a liar. Her brother's a liar. 
Her coworker, Olivia Martinez, is a liar. Kat De Leon, her hairdresser of years, she's a liar. Jamie Scarpa, that she's met one time, one time, that woman's a liar. Chuck's girlfriends are all liars. Freddie Chapman, when he says that she's driving, he's a liar. And so is Dax Stevens. October 5th, she calls in for an unknown reason. That's the day that Maricela is supposed to return. That's the day that she goes missing, and she calls into work, unexplained. Her call records show her down in Wilmer. The very first news article that comes out about Maricela is a WFFA news article on October 11th. Nina urgently wants to sell her Pennsylvania home the very next day, calls Jamie Scarpa and says, I need to list it today. Not in a week, not let's sit down and talk about it today. That's just a coincidence. The very first time she's contacted by law enforcement, she lies. And then the very next day, she quits. Unexplained, just out of the blue, according to her coworker. Is that just a coincidence, too? These are all just in October. We're asking for a, a guilty verdict on both charges in this case, on behalf of the Dallas County community, the family of Maricela Botello, and our victim, Maricela Botello Valdez. Thank you. After around 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury reaches a verdict. The jury verdicts read as follows. We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, Lisa Jo Dykes, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. For the second case, we, the jury, Unanimously find the defendant, Lisa Jo Dykes, guilty of tampering with physical evidence as charged in the... Having been found guilty, the trial enters the punishment phase. It's here that Lisa's counsel would argue for a reduced sentence due to the circumstance of sudden passion. Now, your decision was obviously made based on the testimony of Charles Beltran. You found him credible. You found what he said about what happened to uh, Maricela credible that this was a vicious um, uh, uh, murder that happened over in Mesquite. But more importantly, what he told you and what the detective said he told them, she was jealous, she was obsessed. That's the evidence that you believed. That's the evidence that, that you found credible from the witness stand, that this was a crime of passion. We submit to you it's sudden passion. Based on everything that you heard from Mr. Beltran, what did he tell you about her condition? because you believe him. Now you have to apply the law to what he said, that this was a crime of rage. This was a crime of resentment. This was a crime of anger. That's what he told you. That's what led you to believe that she was a murderer. But the circumstance in which she caused that murder, again, because he's saying she's obsessed with him. That's what he told you. She was out of control to the state where he had to slam her up against the wall to shake her out of it. That's sudden passion. She doesn't have a history of violence. Never seen her act like that before. For some reason, she lost it that night. That's sudden passion. That's what you heard from the witness stand. We, the jury, having heretofore found the defendant, Lisa Jo Dykes, guilty of the offense of murder as charged in the indictment, and not having found by a preponderance of the evidence that such offense occurred while the defendant was under the immediate influence of sudden passion arising from adequate cause, assess her punishment at life in the institution, institutional division. It's at this point of the video that I've finished going over the trial and now dive more into my own thoughts and opinions regarding the case. Right off the bat, I think both Lisa and Charles are big old liars. Despite that though, I do lean more towards Charles' story. That does not mean my eyebrow wasn't raised listening to him testify. There's a lot there that he did which I would say is pretty unacceptable. The numerous women that he messed around with and brought into this mess. The way he shirked his duties as a father when he promised himself he wouldn't do that. Only thinking of his daughter and bringing the truth out after being caught. Also, he states that he was coming back to Dallas after being in Miami because he wanted to turn himself in, but from the way I look at things, it really didn't seem like he was going to do that at all, seeing as he had this whole plan to end up in Las Vegas. Furthermore, if his story is to be believed, 
that he woke up to Lisa stabbing Maricela. I'm pretty astounded that he would put the life of that woman he met in Miami, Nicole Beauchamp, in jeopardy in the same way. He brought her over to come have sex, full well knowing that Lisa was there, and that she had killed a woman before for the very same reason. All of this, at the very least, shows a man who is incredibly stupid and selfish. With that being said though, he didn't strike me as a killer, dumb, reckless, terrified and out of his depth for sure, but not a killer. His story about how the struggle unfolded between Lisa and Maricela was too specific and detailed, and the reasons he followed Lisa and Nina around the different states and countries are far more believable when I look at it from his perspective. He's a terrified man who knows that he looks guilty, and he's hoping that his two legal sugar mamas can smooth the whole thing over. I sat for hours thinking about how I would react in his situation, and the answer is, I don't really know. He's covered in tattoos, has a criminal record, has no money to his name, and trusts these two attorneys. The idea of coming forward to the police would be intensely scary. On top of this, maybe he might have been feeling some loyalty towards them as well, or maybe he might have felt guilt that he caused this death due to disobeying Lisa's orders. He's described by so many as the sort of person who can't handle pressure, so it looks to me that he distracted himself with the day-to-day, moment-by-moment events that made his life feel so normal before. Sex, alcohol, parties and more. He wasn't just fleeing from the enormous problems he faced physically, trying to keep himself out of jail, but I would put money that he was fleeing from his own psychological torment as well. And in doing so, He lied constantly to anybody that he interacted with to keep the heat of the truth away. When I was listening to the defense, I have to admit, they did have a good point when they highlighted that everyone close to Charles couldn't tell when he was being dishonest. If I follow that thought, it does lead me to have a slight hint of doubt. Could he have done it? Could he be the one who killed this young woman? Possibly because she didn't want to have sex with him, or maybe it was a drunken accident, and now he's putting on the performance of a lifetime, a lifetime of dishonesty training him for the moment where he would try to convince a jury that two criminally record-free attorneys are responsible for the death of a young woman. Ultimately, we'll never truly know. If I had to put money on it, I would say that the truth lies somewhere closer to the fact that Lisa did do it, but Charles knew about it, and probably did a lot more to cover his tracks than he let on. Speaking of liars though, the boldness of Lisa Dykes getting on the stand and saying that they had no sexual relationship. (laughs) What was she thinking? She strikes me as having a level of Anthony Tote narcissism, thinking that a jury would believe her when there's countless witnesses testifying against her version of events. It's a hard truth to believe that 10 plus people Some of them her friends, randomly decided to lie about her in a capital murder case, like the hairdresser for example, or her ex-co-worker. Why would she lie? Is Lisa's reasoning that they did this for shits and giggles? Is this how she wanted the jury to believe that these women entertain themselves? Lisa's story is covered with the mark of a liar that has been backed against a wall. She couldn't admit that she was having sex with Charles that would implicate her and her image too much. She couldn't admit that she might have known about Maricela's body and even helped dispose of it. Otherwise, she would have faced the same tampering charges that both Charles and her wife faced. Instead, she took her chances trying to convince a jury that 10 other people are lying about her. How big must this woman's ego be? I know she was a good negotiator, and people described her as being able to convince anyone to do anything she wanted. But my gosh, that skill really got put to the test in this situation, hey? You've probably heard me say it before. I do hate to accuse people of being narcissists, but the mark of one was strong with Lisa. Never being able to answer a question from the cross-examiner with a simple yes or no. Uh, Olivia Martinez, I'll say Rodriguez again. Mm -hmm. Olivia Martinez, she was uh, somebody that you were training, right? She was someone I trained, yes. And you guys uh, kept the same office, didn't you? She was put into my office so that I could train her. Okay, so you guys shared an office, didn't you? Yes. And uh, 
as any body that shares an office, you guys get in personal uh, conversations, right? Olivia liked to listen to my phone calls. As far as personal conversations go, uh, no. Even if she agreed with the question, she had to find a way to answer it, to show the jury that she is smarter, that she's not being defeated. And on top of that, the endless rambling, her answers that would just go on and on, it really sounds like someone who's trying to confuse everyone with her narrative of what the facts are. And if she talks enough, if she speaks with enough conviction, then eventually they'll believe her story. He told me absolutely, under no circumstance, should I fly. So they were that bad that I, I couldn't really travel by plane with them because plane and the pressure in, in the plane itself was going to cause that to be a lot worse. It would increase bleeding. It would increase the difficulties that I was having with it and worsen them. Nina and Bill had a house that was in Staten Island. That house was way overfinanced and upside down, basically is the best way to describe that house. They, they paid very little money for this house. That was a four-bedroom house, four-bedroom, three-bath. But the house was in poor condition, so they would only go there. Nina would go sometimes by herself on the weekend, but she didn't live there. They did not reside there. In particular, we started to have an issue with a case that I had brought in, and I brought it in from my contact. It was a case that was wrongful death. And in personal injury, wrongful death cases settle for a considerable sum of money. Like, one of the bonusing structures that we had when we brought these cases in was a percentage of the settlement, right? The face was still an issue. Like, I wasn't supposed to bend over. Like, you, you can't really bend over like this whenever you've got, like, surgery to the lower part of your face. Um, the pain from it was not as bad. I was a little surprised that my ear wasn't attached on my right side whenever I came home. So I had a few things going on with that and the wounds were still raw and open. I've raised children, I feel like, from the time I was born. Like, you know, my kids are older, but they've always been with me and I've always been spending money on them. There's never enough money. It's gone before you get it. Although I have some questions regarding Charles's story, what I don't have any questions about is what I believe Lisa to be, an obsessive, overworked, latecomer to a midlife crisis that was brought on by two separate life-threatening ordeals, a person who has commanded attention and respect their whole life and now found herself wanting a young man's attention. Someone who is able to attract this man, despite not being someone he is attracted to, like a true predator, she constructed an environment where he would wander into it and stay, and he would not fully comprehend what this construct is that he was playing with. Sure, some people may say that he was equally taking advantage of her. At the end of the day, look at all the goods she purchased for him. But ultimately, I think not. She pursued him. She altered her appearance for him. She moved her family to another state for him. She was desperate to hold on to the attention of this man. And sure, once he tasted the good life, he may have played into it, but that environment was constructed and controlled by her. She controlled the money, she controlled the man, and she did so in a way that made him feel free. But he wasn't sitting as still as she would have liked. She was becoming frustrated. The argument with Nina about sleeping with him, the rule of no more women to come to the house, when the object of her obsession was straying too far from her rules, I believe she snapped. I don't know if this was an exertion of control, or an emotional explosion triggered by life's stresses and pressures, or even some sort of symbolic gesture to show Charles who's the boss. Whatever her reasons, I do think it was a raw moment of passion, an anger fueled crime that likely shocked her as much as it did Charles and Nina. If it's one thing that I agree with the defense on, and not the jury, is that this crime probably did involve sudden passion indeed. Moving away from this messy group of lovers now, I want to focus on Maricela. I've unfortunately been having a lot of trouble finding any information online about her, and there was only one victim impact statement from her younger brother. What I was able to gather was mostly the affections of her family and friends that testified during the trial. Each and every one emotional at the loss of their loved one. They would speak about the profound impact Maricela had on their lives. Her joyous nature and positive outlook on the world, which was always present, and now will be forever missed. 
There was one story from her brother which stood out. He stated that he was the only boy in his year at school who didn't have a cell phone. He asked his parents countless times for them to buy him one, but they were unable to afford it. He recalls his sister coming home one day, not long after she got her first job, and she had a bag with her from a local electronics store. He thought she had purchased something for herself, but it turns out she used all of her savings to get him a phone. He talks about how difficult it's been for his family to cope with the loss of Maricela, and how his mother in particular has astonished him with her strength and composure. Maricela seemed like a bright young girl, right at the beginning stages of her adulthood, excited to be alive, making opportunities for herself, working hard and having fun within reason. The misfortune for her to stumble upon Charles and his twisted little sex triangle is something that bothered me to no end whilst looking at this case. I found myself thinking over and over, if only some slight things worked out differently, she'd still be here. If Charles didn't see his ex-girlfriend that night, he wouldn't have found himself on the street and would have missed Maricela walking by. If Raul didn't get drunk and lose his house keys, they would have went into the apartment together and spent the night there. But these are all what-ifs, and that's not what has happened at all. It's so easy to lose oneself in the spectacle of the other people in this story. The countless witnesses who made me chuckle because they hated Charles' music. Honestly, after he got arrested is when I looked up his music. <laughs> what was your impression of his rap music? I couldn't see anybody investing in it. The many interesting, yet in my opinion, delusional women who helped Charles when they should have turned him in. Lisa's brother, who works at Disneyland, who seemed like a real classic character up on the stand. And the hints towards witchcraft and stranger beliefs. It's all so very interesting, and the situation is so complicated. But ultimately, I wish I never had to learn about it. I wish that Maricela was still here with her family, and all of these people continued on with their lives, existing in their own little bubble, never having to take the stand for all of us to observe their dirty laundry. It's the same way I feel when looking at the majority of victims when I work on videos such as these. I truly do wish things happened differently here. Thank you.